Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lefteris Sonidis, and I'm a member of the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum. And I would like to welcome you to today's workshop on the EU blockchain ecosystem. These are the housekeeping rules. The workshop will last for approximately three hours. To ask a question, please use the Q&A section only. You can ask the question either with your name or anonymously. If you would like uh, not to ask a question or just leave a remark, you can do so in the chat. The most relevant questions will be selected and be directed to the panelists for an answer, provided there is enough time. Those, uh, this workshop will be recorded. Only what is said and presented on the screen uh, will be recorded, so your questions will not appear in the recording. The recording sessions will be uploaded on our media channels uh, a few days uh, after this event. All registered participants will also receive links to the workshop presentation and the recorded session by email. To kick things off in this workshop, we are happy to hear from the head of the Digital Innovation and Blockchain Unit of Digital Connect in the European Commission, Mr. Petris Zilgalvis. Mr. Zilgalvis, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Uh, it's a regular occurrence to be here at these uh, great webinars, uh, unfortunately virtual now, but the fortunate part is that we can link up with our interested parties across Europe and across the world. So not just physically, though we miss getting together uh, together in a physical place uh, again as well. This is, I think, a particularly relevant webinar. Uh, I think, as you know, we have always seen the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum as the knowledge and the community of our uh, common blockchain strategy. Then we have the European Blockchain Partnership, the 29 countries building the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, who we're going to hear from today. We work very closely as well with the stakeholders, with the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications, who will also be here today giving their point of view. Uh, we also invest in blockchain through initiatives like the AI Blockchain Fund and an upcoming green tech fund, which though not obviously confined to blockchain, could also be funding scale-ups and startups working with disruptive di um, digital technologies like blockchain. We are also in a context now where the member states are filling out their uh, recovery and resilience plans for the recovery and resilience facility, where 20% of the investments are going into digital including, and we underline, we see a lot of opportunities for cross-border, but also connecting different communities, different cities, different departments and stakeholders nationally. And this is where it's very interesting, both in the context of our work with the private sector, trying to close the investment gap, which we still do have when we compare ourselves to China or the United States, but we're growing in terms of investment and in terms of getting the best public investments out of this hopefully once in a lifetime investment, which will be uh, following up on this still ongoing crisis of COVID. We have a really unique chance to build a digital infrastructure and private sector ecosystems that can benefit from public sector investments in the areas of blockchain, but more broadly, the converging technologies, artificial intelligence, IoT, big data. So these are challenging, but exciting times. So this report, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to have the pleasure, I say, because I don't get pulled out for some other, other meeting or other task uh, during these hours. I'll have the pleasure of listening to see really what the comments are on this excellent report of the different ecosystems that we see in our different nation states of the European Union, and as well to get a real snapshot of where Europe is as a whole. And my reading of it is we're in good position. We have a lot of great entrepreneurs, a lot of great technical talent. We have supportive governments, a supportive European Union, but there's more that we need to do. We want to be really global players on the level of China and the United States, obviously trading and interacting with them, but that Europe has its technological sovereignty and that Europe has its scale-ups and unicorns too. 
and why not specifically in the blockchain area? And with that, I pass the floor back to our, our organizers. I'm greatly looking forward to the upcoming keynote also from member of European Parliament, Eva Kaili. The European Parliament is an important part of our institutional makeup here in the European Commission. And among other things, we see the markets and crypto assets regulation right now going through the parliament and the council, hopefully towards a speedy adoption. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I look forward to enjoying this webinar. Thank you very much, Mr. Zagalvis. Uh, our next speaker uh, is mentioned in our latest ecosystem report as an active supporter of the development and the use of blockchain technology, as well as someone who is regarded as a key policymaker in the blockchain field. We are happy to welcome for the keynote speech, member of European Parliament, Mrs. Eva Kaili. Mrs. Kaili, thank you for joining our workshop. The floor is, the floor is yours. So um, I want, first of all, to thank you, uh, Lefteris Tonivis and uh, Yorgos Yaglis, and uh, congratulate you for taking over the European uh, Blockchain Observatory and Forum. And um, I think it's uh, really important to have uh, to achieve the continuity also with people that are experts and they have uh, your level and your quality of understanding of blockchain. You were um, the first, actually, to realize the potential of this technology and uh, also helped me with um, uh, the initiatives I took in the European Parliament to uh, suggest a report that would cover in a positive way uh, the approach towards this technology in different sectors. And I think we had a good basis for, for Europe. Now it seems we are more maturing to uh, moving to the next step and um, finding ways to harmonize the European environment. Um, we have understood already the shortcomings of this technology and also the, the tremendous potential. We realize that it's not the solution for every problem. Um, I think uh, we are beyond that now. And I also believe that um, the convergence with the new uh, uh, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, um, uh, smart contracts could uh, uh, be realized on blockchain now and supply chains uh, could be uninterrupted. We saw problems when the pandemic started and everybody's mind was that um, blockchain could have actually helped us overcome these pro problems if we had adopted these new technologies earlier. Um, the same goes with health data, cryptography, and blockchain systems, uh, making our lives more easy and making sure that we, um, uh, we take the advantage of not of just the technology, but also um, in the special case of Europe that we have different systems to be able to harmonize the environment and start collaborating by using the trust that these technologies providing us um, and move faster than we would have otherwise to create the digital single market. Um, so, um, and I, I haven't seen all the participants, but uh, because again, I had to switch my device, but I believe that Peter Zilgalvis um, is here and I also want to thank him because it's also very important um, to make sure that the parliament and the commission have the expertise to proceed and not to compete, but to proceed together and add that value and make sure that we will um, create an environment for entrepreneurs and the economy to benefit from, uh, from this technology. Um, so at this point where we have the realization of the, um, the role that uh, disruptive technologies will play, we stop having this approach that ECB and Mario Draghi had in the beginning, being hesitant, but monitoring the, the technology, uh, mentioning that uh, they don't consider it a threat or uh, that it will play a big part. Um, but now everybody's realizing that it's inevitable to have to understand it and to uh, use, to use it and to maximize its potential because you have China you have US now actually moving much faster. Um, so Europe should not be left behind because we were leading um, into, um, into setting up the main framework and the basis of a positive approach to this technology. Um, so I think um, in, in several levels, we tested it already um, in the European uh, Parliament with several pilots. We have uh, governmental processes that we can achieve in a safer way. We already discussed on uh, e-voting 
We discuss smart contracts, licensing, certification, even identity on blockchain. So the main um, the, the main um, abilities that blockchain has is to create trust, and the main problems that Europe has is exactly on this in this level. Um, so basically, we have uh, we have seen also the shortcomings. We've seen that it's 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 not super flexible as a technology, and it's not easy to scale. And it has um, uh, it's really important to understand that from the beginning you have to design it in a way that it will not create frictions later. Uh, it's very important to have the right architecture so that this technology will be a platform um, that can, or everybody could like join and, and use its, uh, um, its services. But at the same time, if things change in regulation, we know that it's very difficult to, to change uh, initially the design of, of a blockchain. Um, so I would say that uh, mainly everybody was talking about how it cuts the costs. I was also very happy to say that the banking system's hidden cost is really something we have to overcome. And uh, since we have these amazing technologies that cost much less, um, we, should, we should definitely um, try to use them to benefit citizens. I remember, um, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Potamikis from, um, uh, fr from the University of Nicosia, I, or Yorgos Yaglis, I don't remember. One of the two told me that he had to send money to a family member beyond uh, Europe, and they had to pay a huge amount of money to make this transaction, and they had to wait several to wait several days. The same week, I was trying to send money from Brussels to Greece um, for an emergency that came up, and I realized I had to wait three days for this transaction to take place. So I had to call my family, ask them to do the payment and then send the money to them in order to make it faster. Um, and um, we saw with the pandemic that uh, everybody's trying now to use new technologies to make cross-border transactions faster, cheaper and safer. So now you don't have to have really a physical presence in a different country if you have to make a transaction, things are happening more and more online and blockchain can safeguard that they will happen with a minimum cost and uh, much faster also. Um, so since we can improve these basic ma main and crucial sectors actually of our lives, um, I think everybody who was resistant and in denial or defensive uh, has changed their minds. Um, I will give just an example that I think it's really interesting um, about the disruption, but also the positive disruption of blockchain. So we talk about building trust and uh, uh, benefits to multiple organizations and the traditional, um, the traditional uh, industry should actually implement it to be more resilient, to implement and adopt new technologies. Um, but so, sometimes they felt that they were threatened as business models. So you remember Kodak, the, uh, the traditional um, huge uh, photography uh, industry uh, had devices, they had films, you could take photos, you could print them. Um, so it, it actually has been struggling to stay competitive once these smartphones came out. Everybody was taking photos online, they could print it at home. So this, this company reinvented themselves through blockchain technology um, by using, by creating the Kodak on a management platform to create an encrypted digital ledger of copyright ownership. So what they did is photographers can register both new and old photos and then they can license it on the platform. So it, it enables professionals also to participate in the new economy of photography with instant secure payments uh, for each uh, photo that's being sold. I think this is a very interesting example of, of how someone could see the positive disruption that this technology brings. Um, the challenges that uh, we have ahead and the role of the um, EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum are also uh, significant and challenging. Um, and of course in Europe, since we have not managed to have a digital single market, we still have work to do. So we have to definitely work together for um, uh, legal issues to create legal certainty. It's really crucial for the stability of the market and to 
um, to get the maximum of the potential of this technology, the technology itself and the cooperation. So um, we need to have uh, definitely standards, not just European, but global standards to be able to, uh, to achieve this uh, harmonization that I said. And this means we have to answer uh, many legal questions that remain unanswered. We are already working on the MICA and DLT pilot regime files in the Econ Committee. So hopefully by the end of the year, um, we will have a better understanding on, on where EU is standing and I'm working on, also on both files. Um, so we have fragmented regulations um, that create uh, headaches to businesses, I would say, across Europe because they have now to deal with national systems where they exist and where they don't exist. It's really uncertain how they can proceed. Um, and because blockchains are immutable, the regulators uh, change their minds and the blockchains might actually fail. So they cannot really be easily amended. So we also need, as I said, um, standardization. So common standards, but clearly defined regulation is, is the first step to achieve that. And um, we have also to find ways to um, to be compatible with the legal definitions across the globe. And um, in technology, we already have improvement of the technology. We find, I, I, uh, I'm listening about uh, new blockchains that spend less energy. So it seems that um, they are actually viable because a lot of people were saying that it's not viable because of the energy consumption. Um, and the choices that the designers make in the, they have to make in the beginning, they're now much more sophisticated because a lot of um, you know, expectations were uh, hidden in each blockchain uh, new uh, application, but they did manage to fulfill everything. So they realized that they have to design it better in advance. And um, I think to increase the size of the network to bring more people on board has happened. Actually, I think the, the pandemic has been a catalyst to bring more people on board because more people participating uh, creates more trust actually of this technology because it, it's more difficult to, to break um, by nature. Eh? It's, uh, it's cryptography and the potential of the decentralized finance is now something that uh, also the uh, defensive ones, they have to accept. Um, and now I can also talk about it without uh, uh, having people like uh, resisting that it's going to happen. I think it's unstoppable actually. So um, one thing, a final thing that I, I would like to add is also that we, we have tested it. So we have seen that the maturity is there. This is a technology that started basically in 2008 in the lack of, uh, of trust from our, our economic finance systems and smart people came out and they provided us with like new solutions. And it's a nice tool that we can use it to solve different problems. And as I said, to connect it with other technologies and the automation of artificial intelligence to have um, better results, to have more secure transactions or, or contracts and to make sure that we can uh, be online basically at, uh, at the maximum level. And I have not even mentioned the tokenization. This is something that I believe it's extremely interesting, complicated. It's a matrix we have to solve. We have to create new boxes, hybrid boxes. So the, um, the presentation today, it would be helpful also for us while we're drafting this legislation to make sure we will include everything that is not being covered by the, uh, by the old uh, boxes. And um, there is also an ethical and maybe philosophical way that uh, I saw in blockchain and I, I was very interested uh, in this technology back in 2014, is that it, it enables the cooperation, um, the safe data sharing, and uh, it, in, it, it felt that removing intermediaries or decentralization that was actually difficult to overcome has given us, the citizens actually, more options and less excuses for the banks to make mistakes and also for the big companies. So this decentralization, this, um, the way that we can share data has 
I think, change the conversation about what is ethical and this has raised now in, in our agenda. So we talk about ethics and we talk about using technologies that can make this happen without, um, without excuses. And of course, it can uh, create an amazing infrastructure to, to achieve that uh, by, by design. Because I remember when I was talking about ethics and trust by design, they were telling me, no, oh, we don't have the technology to achieve that. Well, we do have the technology to achieve that. Uh, we have the vision to do so. We need the tools, we need the legal framework, the harmonization and experts like uh, yourselves in order to, to make things right. Um, so basically, I would expect to listen to the results of the, the report that's gonna be um, actually presented uh, I think it was done in November 2020, and I'm happy to keep working with you because uh, still we're going to have a lot of controversies and we're going to have different approach to deal with during the legislative period and during our work on these files. So I'd be happy to keep working with you and thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kiley. Thank you for joining us uh, for the second uh, year you were uh, here in uh, uh, last year's uh, workshop as well. So uh, in our next session, uh, our uh, next speaker is Professor George Yaklis from the University of Nicosia. He is here to present the methodology and also the key findings of our EU blockchain ecosystem developments report. Professor Yaklis, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Hello, hello again. Uh... Let me share my screen. I would say he's also my professor. I'm following uh, yeah. online courses of the University of Nicosia, and I really think uh, it, it's helping me to have a better understanding. So um, I will follow also this one. Thank you. Super, super proud to have you among our students. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here to present on behalf of our partners at the European Blockchain Observatory and Forum. Uh, the main findings of our first thematic report, which is the state of the uh, EU blockchain uh, ecosystem. So the, the report was, uh, as the new consortium running UBOF, uh, we agreed with the Commission that we needed a reference work regarding the state of blockchain and crypto assets in Europe, because to the best of our knowledge, we couldn't find one single uh, updated report that would uh, provide all the details regarding what is happening in, in, in all member states of the European Union, uh, as well as in other European countries. So we set out as our first thematic report uh, to produce this. And this report contains an analysis of 29 different countries. So we went uh, to each and every one of the 27 EU member states, plus Switzerland and the United Kingdom that, as you know, present uh, uh, a significant interest when it comes to blockchain and crypto adoption. And we analyzed uh, all these countries uh, in two levels. So at the first level, we provided country level overviews. So we went to each one of these 29 countries and we uh, uh, noted down a synopsis of the state of blockchain in that country. And at the second level, we provided an evaluation, a comparative evaluation between uh, these countries uh, in terms of uh, their um, uh, ecosystems or regulatory maturity uh, and so on. So this resulted in a really detailed report. Uh, it's more than 200 pages of material there. And I hope it, uh, it, it proves to be, uh, and it has proven to be, uh, I think in this month, a reference point for the development of policy uh, of uh, regarding blockchain in Europe. Uh, the University of Nicosia had the scientific coordination of the report, but I would like to acknowledge the help of our colleagues at uh, the UBOF consortium, so Intrasoft, International, uh, CERT, Bitfury, Open Forum Europe, uh, Planet, and White Research. So at the first level of analysis, as I said, we, we, uh, we concerned ourselves with individual countries. So we produced 29 different country level fact sheets and each fact sheet is a five to 10 page report for focusing on a particular country and to be comparable to each other, all the fact sheets follow the same structure. So we have a general profile of the state of blockchain in each particular country and the key metrics and findings 
uh, that have emerged from our research. We then follow with a discussion uh, of the key initiatives, whether that uh, be policy, regulatory, educational, research, uh, or other. Uh, then we provide a synopsis of the national uh, business ecosystem and entrepreneurial environment in each uh, uh, country. So the types of companies, the sectors that are more prevalent in this country, uh, funds that were raised by these companies, and so on. Uh, we have a discussion regarding users, because as you know, uh, lots of things in crypto are bottom-up and grassroots movements. Uh, so we were very interested to see what types of user communities exist in different European countries and how they are mobilized and where uh, they are based geographically. And finally, we have uh, interviews with experts that we, uh, we uh, worked with for the production of this report. I would like to thank all our experts. We have more than 100 experts now in our Yubo pool, as well as the people uh, from the different countries, the stakeholders that helped us produce uh, this material. So this is uh, like the bulk of the report is the individual uh, fact sheets and they provide, as I said, a, a reference uh, point for, for the state of blockchain in Europe. But I think the most interesting part is probably the cross-country analysis. So we, we did a comparative evaluation of what's happening in Europe across three dimensions, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the academic initiatives and regulation. So we looked at things like uh, the size of the blockchain industry in each of the countries and um, uh, in Europe as a whole, in terms of the number of blockchain companies we could identify, uh, the VC funding that they have secured, and what this tells us about the state and the growth of blockchain in each of the countries. Uh, as I mentioned, we then followed with academic initiatives focusing both on education and training, professional training programs, uh, but also identifying research groups and projects. And we plan to, with the help of the European Commission, to also uh, add an interactive map in, uh, in the UBOF portal where everyone can see what types of academic initiatives uh, exist across Europe. So this will be ready in the coming weeks. And finally, we looked at the regulatory maturity and the state of affairs in each of the country in terms of the existence of uh, legislation that is focused on crypto assets, whether there is a national blockchain and or related strategy uh, announced by, uh, by national governments, the existence of regulatory sandboxes or other state initiatives um, that would uh, uh, show us the level of support by the state in each uh, member state. Uh, starting with the size of the European blockchain industry, we were able to identify uh, close to 3,000 uh, companies that are focused on blockchain and crypto, uh, both being startups that this represents the uh, entirety of their, of their business uh, model, but also incumbents, especially from the IT sector, companies that have either pivoted or added a business line related to, to blockchain. Uh, now, at the first level analysis, interestingly, uh, the European member states host around half of these companies, while the, the rest are, are based in Switzerland and United Kingdom. And if we looked at the distribution of companies in the EU member states, uh, you would notice that there is a group of countries, uh, including Germany, France, Netherlands, Spain, and Estonia that host the majority of the companies are like at a different level uh, from other EU countries. Uh, as I said, that's a first level analysis though, because obviously this does not take uh, into account the fact that we are talking about countries of different sizes. So the fact that, for example, Spain and Estonia have a similar number of blockchain companies is probably uh, 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 reflects that Estonia is at a more advanced level in the sense that it has only a fraction of the population of a country like Spain. So at a second level analysis, we looked at the uh, uh, per capita distribution of blockchain companies around Europe, so uh, controlling for, uh, for population. And there you would see that it's not Switzerland and the United Kingdom that they take the lead, but actually the uh, the, the champions in Europe are countries like uh, Malta, Estonia, 
uh, Luxembourg and maybe Cyprus that have a, a larger number of companies compared to their population. We then moved uh, forward to, to look at, at the funds that the blockchain and crypto ecosystem in Europe has managed to raise from, uh, from uh, this year other sources. And we were able to identify more than 7.5 billion euros of such entrepreneurial funding uh, uh, raised, including uh, uh, funds raised through initial coin offerings or other uh, blockchain focused uh, methods of raising funds. Again, uh, if you look at this by, by total funds raised, uh, Switzerland and the United Kingdom uh, take the lion's share. It's like 84% uh, of the total with uh, Lithuania, the Netherlands and Estonia being the top three EU member states. But again, this is not the, the, the right picture. If we look at this uh, per capita, Switzerland continues to be uh, top of the list because uh, of uh, uh, the Ethereum Foundation or uh, the Zook Valley, the Crypto Valley there, you know that there's a very strong ecosystem there. But other countries from uh, Europe like Estonia, Cyprus, Lithuania and Malta also have an impressive uh, amount of money raised in, uh, by blockchain companies. Uh, this is the distribution per capita. Again, uh, Switzerland is a, a, a league of its own, but then we have similar set of countries, not exactly the same as the number of companies. So Estonia, Cyprus and Malta we see again, but also in Lithuania being very successful in terms of raising capital uh, related to, to blockchain. At the second level, we looked at uh, academic initiatives where Europe is, and uh, we're proud to, proud to say that it is a global leader in blockchain and crypto education. I'm even prouder to say that uh, uh, we at the University of Nicosia have launched the, the first program, not only in the European Union, but also in the whole world uh, back in 2013. But since then, the ecosystem has, has grown and we welcome this growth. We have no less than 18 programs in uh, 11 different countries today. And these are either academic degree programs where Spain has emerged as a very, very strong uh, contender with eight different universities offering programs related to blockchain and then other countries uh, following that. But also uh, non-academic like uh, research oriented summer schools or professional training programs uh, in other countries. Um, as you will see, between 2013 and 2017, there was only the University of Nicosia offering. But since 2018, we are witnessing a steady growth in the uh, academic offerings in this, uh, uh, in this market, something that I think is very important in the sense that um, it will provide the skilled talent that is needed to uh, to, uh, to, to be the basis of the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Europe uh, tomorrow. Uh, finally, we developed a, a three-stage maturity model to, to measure the regulatory maturity, maturity of different countries when it comes to, to blockchain. So at the first stage, we have grouped countries that either do not have any specific legislation at the moment or have only issued uh, warnings by the relevant authorities for investment protection from the volatility of crypto assets or have some small scale national initiatives. At the second stage, a stage of maturity above that, we have countries that uh, have voted frameworks for parts of the ecosystem. For example, uh, know your customer or anti-money laundering or taxation, taxation related uh, legislation or have set up um, uh, specific uh, to crypto and blockchain task forces by the government. They have launched blockchain uh, related uh, pilots in the public sector or have uh, signs of strong support of research by, by the government. And finally, at the third stage, the more mature uh, countries are those that have either voted uh, through their parliaments uh, comprehensive pieces of digital assets legislation or have announced national blockchain strategies, have implemented regulatory sandboxes and so on. Uh, so the distribution of countries in our sample is, is uh, pretty much even. So we have 11 countries 
in stage one maturity, 11 countries in stage two and seven countries in stage three. And because regulation is not the only uh, interesting thing here, we complemented this model by looking also at the maturity of the ecosystem. And we looked at it through three indicators. So how strong, uh, big and growing is the business ecosystem, as, as I mentioned earlier, how dynamic are the user communities in each country and what is the level of academic initiatives that we see. And again, we use the three stage model where uh, we, we put countries in stage, stage one, two or three, uh, depending on whether our research team could see evidence of strong um, uh, ecosystems in uh, one, two or all three of these dimensions. Again, this produced a relatively um, uh, uh, fair distribution. So we have 11 countries in stage one maturity, 10 countries in stage two and eight countries in stage three. And, and I think this is the, the main outcome of the report. We synthesized these findings uh, to, to group uh, the countries by uh, combination of their maturity in the regulatory and ecosystem uh, growth to produce a map of the current state of the European uh, blockchain union. So we have uh, at, at, at one end, we have countries that um, are, are in stage one maturity in both regulatory and ecosystem growth. Uh, then we have a set of countries that have achieved a uh, stage two maturity either in either or both dimensions. And then the, the third, uh, let's say, group is the countries that have uh, achieved level three maturity in either or both of these dimensions with the countries at the top right corner, and namely Cyprus, Estonia, and Malta from the European Union and Switzerland uh, outside it being, uh, let's say, the current blockchain champions. Obviously, this map is not uh, and should not be interpreted as an objective uh, measure. We, many of these things, the, the boundaries between the categories are, are porous, and uh, this map is not a static map. All countries have started at the bottom left corner, and they are moving gradually. We expect in the coming years to see uh, all of them moving to the, to the top right uh, segment as they are commercial ecosystems mature and these necessitate actions uh, from governments and uh, regulatory and ecosystem maturity moving hand in hand. So summarizing, we, we, we were able to identify four factors that favor the uh, development of blockchain at a national level. Uh, number one being regulatory certainty, which allows uh, investors and entrepreneurs to, to to be uh, to feel safe uh, for starting new businesses or, or investing in the ecosystem. Uh, the second is support and signaling of support by the state, either through national strategy or public sector initiatives related to blockchain. Number three is the establishment of a of a climate that is friendly to innovation. Again, this could be related to things like uh, sandboxing but also even basic stuff like uh, providing access to the traditional financial services industry for entrepreneurs working in the blockchain space. And finally, since the human factor is all, always important, the existence or the ability to develop a skilled workforce is, is we think, imperative for, uh, for, for, for building up uh, the, the maturity of Europe uh, when it comes to blockchain. So, Regarding the future, as Peter has said earlier, we are happy to note that the, U, uh, the European blockchain ecosystem is growing and it's growing fast. There's a number of top-down and bottom-up initiatives that combine to create such an innovation-friendly environment. Uh, in the top-down initiatives, some were mentioned and we'll discuss them later in this webinar. We have the European Blockchain Partnership, uh, the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, the uh, make a proposal that is being debated in the European Parliament and the Council uh, as we speak. And in the bottom up, we have a number of uh, user communities, industry um, uh, forums like uh, INATBA that are providing a necessary input from the, from the stakeholders 
uh, for the growth of the system. Naturally, not all European countries are on the same maturity level, but we have found through our uh, study that all of them have their own unique experiences, their own success stories, but also the lessons that they've learned from their involvement with uh, blockchain and crypto so far. And this should be really helpful in informing the development of uh, uh, harmonized EU-wide policies in the future. So I invite everyone to download the full 200 page report uh, uh, from the uh, UBOF uh, website and uh, see for yourself the state of development of blockchain in Europe. Needless to say, we plan uh, together with the European Commission to follow up with a uh, second version of uh, this report next year so that we capture the, the, the developments in this fast moving field. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. We have about 10 minutes uh, for a Q&A session. We have uh, right now three questions, but uh, uh, attendees are welcome to uh, submit more questions uh, if we have time uh, for them. The first question comes uh, with regards to a comparison of the funding received for blockchain startups, if uh, you can compare it to the funding of other more established verticals. Well, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, I should have noted during the presentation that all the data that we have gathered, uh, we, we have gathered them from, from very different sources, right? So we are, there, there is a, always a challenge in uh, having directly comparable data in such a new and fast moving field, even if we are talking about the field itself. Now, comparing it to what happens to, to, uh, to other industries, uh, we, we've seen a huge uh, explosive, I would say, growth in, uh, in funding in 2017 and the early stages of 2018. And this was the ICO uh, craze. Uh, things uh, cooled down a little bit uh, after that. And we have seen since then, we have seen a replacement of, let's say, the retail driven uh, funding, which was the ICO part, with more institutional money coming in, uh, more professional investors, including angel investors, uh, VC funds that were uh, set up and raised. Uh, for blockchain and crypto specifically, but also uh, more uh, generic technology funds uh, looking at uh, strong teams and strong communities in this ecosystem. So in 2017 and 2018, I would say that blockchain represented, and by a long margin, the, the fastest growing sub-segment of VC funding. Uh, it has since uh, gone down to more realistic levels. It, it, is, it is still one of the hottest area for areas for investment along with things like fintech and biotechnologies, I think. Okay, uh, the next question is regarding what would uh, uh, you personally see as the most important regulatory initiatives in the EU, in the EU right now? Well, I think um, that the, the MECA regulation, the Markets and Crypto Assets regulation provides a very good starting point in, uh, in what Europe uh, is needing. As, as, as I noted earlier, I think there are two philosophical underpinnings that any successful regulatory effort should, should satisfy. One of them being uh, to be clear and harmonized across member states so that uh, people know that what um, uh, uh, is, is, is right and true in one member state is also uh, the same in, in, in another, so that people do not have the opportunity to do regulatory arbitrage between, uh, between jurisdictions. So that's important. I think the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council are moving uh, in the right direction uh, through MICA. But the other thing is that this clarity should take into account the need for innovation to flourish. Because if innovation is not supported at the European level, it is not that it will not happen. It is that it will 
we will lose it from Europe. And as Peter has said earlier, we, we are in competition with jurisdictions like the US and China, and we don't want to have a, let's say, stricter or less favorable regime than these jurisdictions because innovation is going to leave Europe and it's going to go um, um, uh, offshore. Um, to this end, I think we, we it is it is important for the decision makers to take into account the uh, the the feedback and the comments from industry. Uh, I know that in Atpa, for example, uh, had a very um, uh, to the point, I think, uh, set of uh, uh, comments on the initial version of the MICA regulation. And I'm looking forward to see how this regulation develops as it's, it's being debated. Uh, but we need to have um, the US and China in our radar, and we need to have the European uh, industry and the European startups also uh, uh, in our radar because there are there are innovations happening literally every day in this field. Mm -hmm. For example, now we have uh, decentralized finance, DeFi, that uh, Eva mentioned uh, earlier, and we have the ability to to have algorithmic uh, processes for uh, the provision of financial services that were traditionally mediated by banks or other financial institutions. And it is sometimes difficult to reconcile the programmability and digital only nature of these initiatives with the need to have a physical presence and offices in the European member states to give to give you just an example. And interestingly, I was looking at um, Coinbase and Coinbase is uh, filing uh, to the to the SEC. And uh, I think it, it, it circulated widely uh, on Twitter, at least the first page of that report where the company needs to say, you know, who they are and what's their registered address. Under, under registered address, they had address not applicable. And they had a footnote explaining that mm -hmm. they are a digital first corporation. And hence, since a few months ago, they do not actually have physical headquarters. So these are things, that, these are realities in the system. We need to take them into account. I'm not saying that we should allow companies to incorporate without having a, a physical address, but I'm, I'm, I'm just signaling that we, we are talking about a different world and the, the realities of this world need to be taken into account by regulation. Professor, you mentioned the US and China. The next question is with regards to how is your uh, own personal rough view of how the European Union compares relative uh, to the rest of the world? Uh, is there any perceived or actual differences between the EU and the rest of the world? Okay, that, that's another very good question. And obviously we could have a whole webinar around, around this and maybe we should at some point. Uh, the United States have taken up to now an approach that is for me uh, is sometimes not internally consistent. So there is, there is, there is a lot of, um, uh, of verbal confirmations regarding the uh, promise of this space and the fact that we need to nurture innovation in it and so on. And there have been some uh, regulatory and policy making initiatives uh, to that, in that direction. But at the same time, we see uh, other initiatives because the, you know, the, 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 the United States have a, a multitude of actors that that are um, responsible for regulating different aspects of the ecosystem, and especially at the state level, that sometimes make things very, very difficult. So for example, New York State, uh, even uh, in the early days with bid license, but even nowadays I, I noticed the uh, Attorney Generals of uh, New York State uh, posting on Twitter yesterday, I think, or today, regarding the need to protect investors uh, from the volatility of these systems and, you know, uh, somewhat hostile uh, reaction towards the emergence in the field. So 
So I think the United States are still trying to, to find their, their, their pace in, in this field. And this presents an opportunity for Europe. Now, when it comes to China, um, China has made uh, huge leaps when it comes to things like, for example, CBDCs. The People's Bank of China are already at least three, if not five years ahead of every other major uh, central bank, perhaps with the exception of Riksbank in, uh, in Sweden, in, uh, in not only researching and studying, not only designing, but also implementing and rolling out a national digital currency. So I think this is something we in Europe need to, uh, to look at very seriously. Uh, at the European Observatory, we are now working uh, on our, our second large report is going to be on CBDCs and the, the design requirements and the design options for a digital euro. Uh, I think once um, digital currencies uh, become legal tender in, in, in major jurisdictions as they will uh, become in China, sooner rather than later, we will be talking about a totally different field. And this is, I think, where Europe needs to be alert and needs to, uh, to decide uh, sooner rather than later how they want to, 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 to attack this space. Thank you very much, Professor. We unfortunately don't have time for any more questions. However, as you mentioned, there will be an updated report in the future and the observatory publishes uh, lots of reports uh, in the in the coming months, so this is uh, valuable input uh, for our future publications. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you for all the questions. We will uh, now move on to our next section. Uh, one of the key actors in the EU blockchain ecosystem is, of course, the European Blockchain Partnership. Our next speaker is the co-chair of the EBP, Mrs. Nena Dukozov, here to present the views and perspectives of the EU uh, blockchain ecosystem by the EBP. Mrs. Dokuzov, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. <laughs> um, will you share my uh, um, presentation, uh, please? Because I will go through a, a little bit uh, also through uh, the historic view of um, our engagement. <clears throat> um, but first, I would like to congratulate uh, to um, you. EU Blockchain um, Observatory and Forum, and for uh, your ma mandate now, because um, what I see in the, uh, your report, uh, uh, it is a very a rich contribution also to our work uh, or, or member states' work. Um, can we go on, please? Um, yeah, maybe uh, to thank you, uh, to uh, go a little bit into uh, the Last um, movements, uh, first, European Blockchain Observatory and Forum was actually the first um, network that was established on the European level. Uh, and then after the signature of the declaration, when the 23 member states uh, signed the declaration on uh, blockchain, um, European Blockchain Partnership was established. European Blockchain Partnership is um, quite a unique form of network uh, and it is based on the part real partnership between the Commission uh, and the member states uh, and um, the, the beginnings were uh, were quite um, unstructured to be were trying to find uh, the certain issues to be uh, developed to be um, covered and uh, um, in the first two meetings uh, we um, tried to select uh, uh, use cases that would be relevant for uh, for um, the, to be taken into consideration. Uh, but uh, like Peteris uh, said uh, at the beginning, um, uh, we had an ambition to become uh, the best and the leading uh, region of the world, uh, but the steps were quite demanding. And um, uh, <clears throat> uh, at the beginning, uh, we defined, we want to have a common infrastructure. Uh, you can uh, go on uh, with um, the next slide. Uh, and we uh, would like to have certain um, use cases that would 
um, be implemented on this uh, blockchain infrastructure, also on cross-border uh, cr cross, uh, um, concept. So um, the next meetings in November, uh, the, uh, October, November uh, 2018, we defined three um, use cases that would be taken into consideration for further um, developments. Uh, the first was digital identity or self-sovereign identity, then diplomas on blockchain and uh, the um, uh, authorization and uh, uh, notarization um, of uh, exec uh, exactly uh, EU funding uh, from uh, the European Court of Auditors. Um, then in 2019 and 20, um, that intensive work on uh, EBSI um, development of use cases and specific groups was uh, implemented. Uh, and uh, there was really um, strong effort to put something together that would function in some uh, period of time. Um, maybe uh, next slide. Um, if uh, I explain the structure, um, EBP policy group is composed by the member states' representatives from each member state uh, and also from um, the EEA uh, area. Uh, this is the first. Uh, second, um, we moved then to uh, also to uh, EBSI technical group. We have here uh, um, experts from uh, different uh, member states and also experts from uh, the community of the member states uh, that are, um, are experts on uh, certain uh, issues. So uh, <clears throat> after that, uh, three working groups uh, were constituted. One was for, for self-sovereign identity. Next was for notarization and uh, authentication, as I said, and uh, taxation. And then the, the uh, third was for uh, diplomas on blockchain. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, the most important milestone uh, here at the blockchain partnership, while we were developing all the things uh, together, was that um, the policy group adopted a mission statement of EBP. It was really a milestone because we uh, organized ourselves uh, and uh, tried to define how to act uh, in the future to support that primary uh, position uh, in the world uh, of the development of blockchain technology. So, um, it was a, dec a decision made that uh, blockchain policy group will work uh, together uh, towards uh, uh, realizing the potential of blockchain-based um, uh, services, uh, focusing on first sharing experiences, knowledge, uh, what also um, uh, Petteris mentioned at the beginning, uh, key learning and uh, close cooperation between um, policy and the regulatory uh, um, uh, cooperation between member states and European ecosystem. Uh, then uh, promoting interoperability, uh, we are working on this with the development of EBSI, but also with the development of uh, national uh, protocols that are very important and can um, substantially contribute here to uh, that um, <clears throat> pioneer uh, position of the European Union. Uh, then um, if we go to the next slide, uh, what was that in the policy group um, uh, uh, decided that um, policy and European Commission have to agree on creation of new um, uh, EBSI user group to be set up as an, uh, to, to adopt new use cases. I have to say that uh, in the next um, uh, years, uh, or actually 2020, we adopted um, or we adopted a decision to support uh, another three use cases, which I will talk about uh, a little bit later. Um, as already mentioned, uh, EVP policy group uh, uh, is consistent uh, with uh, national representatives um, and also um, uh, we uh, developed or established uh, a go group for certain technical issues. Uh, what was also decided and uh, what we think is the most important uh, achievement of uh, uh, this 
um, continuous uh, work with uh, within the European Blockchain Partnership was uh, um, introduction of voting of, of co-chairmanship uh, and of the rotation uh, that is based on uh, European Commission Presidency uh, or Council Presidency trio. So for the first uh, co-chairmanship, we had um, we had uh, three countries uh, that were uh, randomly selected, but for um, uh, starting with the German presidency, uh, then we um, decided to participate all the three um, member states that uh, will cover that trio, so uh, Germany, Portugal and uh, Slovenia. Um, and I'm as a Slovenian um, <clears throat> representative a part of this co-chairmanship trio that is uh, quite uh, intensively working on uh, the developments on uh, future actions. So uh, in 2020, uh, EPSI version uh, one was launched and then um, no first nodes were opening uh, the member states. Uh, I have to say that um, uh, the, also the financial uh, participation and the financial support was uh, started to be insured for blockchain services infrastructure. Um, so the te Safe Telecom uh, call was uh, launched and um, uh, I think that 19 uh, applications from member states were uh, successful. We also selected three new use cases. This is uh, social security um, uh, card, uh, uh, SME uh, financing and asylum uh, that were uh, proposed by uh, three member states. So what we have for 221, um, it, uh, the, the debate was about uh, Digital Europe program. Uh, we know that uh, it has been upgraded uh, and uh, there is uh, another upgraded version um, launched recently. Um, then uh, we will work on blockchain strategy and uh, here uh, the reports from uh, EU blockchain forum will be very welcome. Um, uh, because uh, it can be really um, strong input uh, proceeded also for the blockchain strategy that we will um, um, develop on the uh, on the European side. Um, then FC version two, and um, uh, we will also launch EBP um, um, po policy group non paper that will try to to define the role of each subgroup uh, in the communication, but also the uh, relations with the uh, international organizations, with the organizations that are uh, within uh, European blockchain ecosystem, um, uh, with uh, INADBA, with uh, EU blockchain policy and uh, 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 EU blockchain um, observatory and forum. And here we see a lot of um, uh, opportunities to uh, cooperate uh, and also to uh, contribute uh, from your si uh, side to our um, papers and documents and from our side what is the um, the um, governmental or uh, national view from the member states point of view. Um, <clears throat> another thing that uh, I would like to say here um, Ms. Eva Kaili was speaking about uh, uh, co coherence between Parliament and uh, the Commission. Here we have to say that um, we, uh, through that um, co-chairmanship, uh, I will be too long if I uh, go on with my presentation, so uh, maybe just um, jump to the last slide. Um, with uh, the uh, Parliament and the Commission, here we are a strong group of uh, EU uh, member states uh, also participating in uh, European blockchain policy group uh, and through co-chairmanship we will try to support uh, uh, your actions and also your contents in the, in the um, uh, reports and in the future work uh, and uh, we believe that uh, there can be also co-habitation uh, also from the member state. Um, this may be, uh, no, go back uh, to the, to the uh, photo. Yes, and this was the first event in Slovenia where we had a very strong meetup in 2017 and this was uh, when all happened. 
uh, and all begin to, to, to happen. Um, we um, organized an event uh, in about 350 persons and uh, we started to build our ecosystem. We will talk about the ecosystem in the next panel or, or in the third panel, but uh, in any case, I would uh, like to say that um, apart from the top five countries that were mentioned in the report, uh, Slovenia comes every time into the sixth uh, place. So I'm very proud uh, of uh, all our ecosystem and our um, findings and uh, the development in Slovenia. We also have a protocol tested uh, within uh, EBSI. This is uh, Hashnet protocol and uh, I hope that uh, also with this we can um, contribute to the development of future of um, European uh, blockchain ecosystem. Uh, so thank you very much for now. I know that I was too long, but uh, in any case, I will be, be pleased uh, to answer any of your questions if they are foreseen to be <laughs> said. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Dokuzov. Uh, we will uh, see you again, uh, as you said, in the third uh, panel. We are yeah. now ready for our first of uh, three uh, panel discussions. The first topic is on the business environment and development of uh, crypto assets and blockchain community. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Alexi Anania, a research coordinator in the Cambridge Center of Alternative Finance and also the co-founder of uh, Barter Trade IO. Mr. Anania, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Lefteri. So welcome everyone to today's first panel. As Lefteri mentioned, I'm Alexi Anania. I'm an alumni of University of Nicosia's MSc program in blockchain and digital currency. I'm a research coordinator at the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, as well as an expert at the European Union, for, uh, uh, European Union Blockchain Observatory and Forum. Today we'll be discussing the various trends, obstacles and drivers behind the business environment and development of crypto assets and the blockchain community. We're fortunate to have a well-positioned panel within the ecosystem to provide their insights, namely Mark Taverna, Monse Guardia, Lucas Ilves, Adrian Croft, and David Coleman. Time permitting, there will be a community Q&A at the end, so for our viewers, please type your questions in the chat. But before we start, I'll let the speakers introduce themselves Let's start, you know, with brief introductions for those who may not know you or your associations. Uh, perhaps, Mark, could we start with you? Yes, uh, Alexei, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. And uh, a wonderful presentation earlier and discussion. I've got to say, when the report first came out in uh, November of last year, I spent much to the chagrin of my wife. I, I spent about an hour and a half reading it and thought what a wonderful body of work and much needed this is. So I'm Mark Tavner. I'm the executive director of Inatba. We are the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications. We represent the DLT and blockchain industry around the world, convening discussions between public and private bodies. So uh, Alexi, at that point, let me pause for want of uh, going into a, a British accented monologue that might send everyone to sleep and give the floor back to the next individual. Thank you, Mark. Manse, would you like to give a short intro about yourself and your association? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi. Uh, and also, thank you, Mark. Uh, you are right. It's very interesting evening. And I love the afternoon evening, depending on the time frame. And I love it, all the information we had already shared. Uh, myself is Monse Guardia. I'm the, I'm the general manager of Alastria. Alastria is an association, a non-profit association. We are based in Spain and we have been born in 2017. And members right now, there is 500 and plus members working together from the enterprise industry, the academia, very important, and also the government. So we are pushing this uh, idea of sharing, as, as Eva Kaili was saying, sharing all together the same understanding of this technology and we will talk about today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. Uh, let's move on to Lucas Ilves. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I'm Lucas Ilves. I'm head of strategy at Gartime. Uh, Gartime is a uh, both Swiss and Estonian uh, blockchain and cryptographic engineering firm that was founded back in 2007 before the word existed. 
um, and uh, and we've built uh, various applications across a bunch of different sectors for government and for for industry. Um, maybe uh, on a personal note, I'd say that um, most of my career I spent working uh, for the Estonian government uh, and. The, various stints for the European Commission, and that one of the things maybe that earlier on in a different hat I did is I helped organize the Tallinn Digital Summit back in 2017, which first sort of instructed the European Commission and, and the member states to start working uh, more actively on blockchain as well as AI. So um, a little bit of prehistory also um, in my background uh, to, to these discussions all happening. I'm really happy to be here and to have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Up next in the order on my screen, uh, Adrian Croft. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Adrian Croft. I'm from the Netherlands and I've been involved in the blockchain area since 2015. I've been the convener of the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. And I'm happy to see in the report of Professor Giaglis that the Netherlands is doing well. And um, I think the Dutch Blockchain Coalition contributed to that a lot. Um, I've been involved in uh, the work of, of ISO, TC307, standards for blockchain, very important, but a very, very tedious work and not progressing as quickly as I would like to. And now I'm a member of INADBA and also of the European Blockchain Observatory Forum. And um, I hope that we can achieve um, even more speed than we already have. I think lots of things are in place in Europe, but I'm sure that we can make some more progress in the coming years. And I would happy to contribute, contribute to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. And finally, David, if you could give a, a brief intro about yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Alexi. Um, yes, my name is David Coleman. Um, I'm the head of product at a small software um, company called IOV42. Um, what are we trying to do at IOV42? We're trying to um, build infrastructure um, software um, that is definitely blockchain inspired, um, but really trying to, to, to meet a lot of the objectives of regulators and businesses and, and the environment which this, this, this forum is all, is all about. Um, so we have the advantage of, of having a lot of learning from the past five, 10 years of blockchain. Um, and we're really trying to, to embrace that learning and, and, and build it into our technology. So excited to be a part of this. Um, and, and representing the sort of software startup in, 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 this, in this forum. Yes, thank you all for that. I sense a, a really interesting combination of perspectives here. Uh, let's, let's dive right in because there's a lot to cover actually. What are, the, what are the key characteristics of the EU blockchain business environment? Which member states in your opinions are leading the race and, and which are lagging behind? And let's, uh, let's continue in the same order we did the intro. But also, of course, feel free to speak out of queue and discuss with other panelists. Um, Mark, we can start with you again. Yeah, thanks, Alexi. So look, from, uh, from a pan-European perspective, so from an EU perspective, we see uh, a highly fragmented and somewhat inconsistent from a regulatory and a legislative environment. Um, and we certainly think that progress is somewhat hampered by a lack of, of talent, especially in the technical and development areas. Um, to turn towards a, another friction point, we see globally, so this is not just at a, a European level, but at a global level, there is, um, as I just mentioned earlier, there is a lack of maturity in the developments of standard, and that's creating a, a, a friction point um, between the technology and applications that's leading to silos. Um, and those silos are at danger, at risk of inhibiting the massive scale opportunities that many in the industry would like to try and reach. In fact, just coming back to a, a European perspective, uh, I'm not sure if other people are hearing a lot of noise on the line. I think someone's microphone is, is playing some noise um but just to uh, thank you just to talk uh, again from a european perspective i think what we see is, is the fragmented reality of between 27 to 30 different approaches to regulation and legislation which really hampers to a certain extent the investment that's required from entrepreneurs because they have great consideration, entrepreneurs mostly when they're thinking of operating at a pan-European level, towards the substantial legal and administrative costs that they might need to undertake to manage compliance. 
And what this creates, and I, I think George spoke to it earlier in his address, it creates a situation of arbitrage, as we see currently, where certain states become more attractive to certain niche activities, or maybe states within the European Union create or develop and launch strategies that are targeted to, to leverage or create competitive advantage for themselves to attract these growing businesses that are based around DLT and blockchain applications that bring this, this highly prized talent uh, from within what is still a somewhat limited talent pool into their own countries. And what we've seen as in ACPA, typically some of the smaller states who have had the ability to act with a high degree of nimbleness, fleet of foot and flexibility have tried to seize that earlier initiative, that early initiative. Uh, and some of these early leaders might be Cyprus, as was mentioned earlier with a national strategy that it rolled out, uh, though as of yet no legislation. Estonia with its digital backbone and digital assets license that was a, a very early adopter and proponent of digital based strategies for governments and subsequently has seen many exchanges at wallets and other crypto assets projects base themselves there, together with Luxembourg, Lithuania, Malta and Gibraltar, which was not mentioned earlier because I guess it's part of the UK. We see some of the slightly larger nations like France and Germany have moved, but maybe less slowly and less aggressively. And they've rolled out legislation to support crypto assets such as France and Germany with their blockchain strategy and a focus on identity and financial services. Uh, and as George mentioned earlier, the UK with a lot of funds raised is starting to show renewed interest in this space, principally as it seeks to find a new position for itself now that it's sadly, in my personal opinion, um, come out of Europe. But I think overall, overall, and this is my final thought, Alexei, before I pass the floor back to you, most of the member states in Europe are frankly left in the shadows of, of the success of Switzerland, who went very early in providing legal certainty around crypto assets and also issuing some very strong and very useful guidance that helped to attract global players of scale into that jurisdiction brought with them the talent and the funding to sit alongside that existing global financial ecosystem. And I do believe that as we look at the individual member states in the European Union, there's still some considerable distance to travel before any of the member states become frankly as attractive as Switzerland looks uh, when they compared side by side. So uh, at that point, Alexei, I pass the floor back to you and other panelists. Thank you, Mark. Um, you may, you make you raise very good points. And basically what I'm hearing is that, you know, although we're moving towards this uh, regulatory clarity, there still is this uh, fragmented, uh, you know, non-standardization. Um, but yeah, Monse, what are your thoughts with regard to the characteristics of the EU blockchain business environment? Yeah, I was hearing Mark and I shared uh, some clearly the view, but I, I will say this is uh, something that is an advantage. No, we need to think about what David was saying 2015, 2017 is not very far away, and there is like, a, as we saw, no, the, the European blockchain partnership is only two, no, three years now, so it's very, very short term for what it is a technology that is evolving. So one thing is that we have uh, quite talented people, persons that are in the tech environment, and we have been seeing the first years of development in tech. And we have reached at this moment a second development that is from legal and regulatory and industry, more clarity on what it is this technology about. No? So I think there is the right balance between right now, no? we are in a right age to balance in 2021, this about co common understanding between uh, somebody who is speaking tech, no? and, and we saw very clearly that there is lots of advantage on this technology, but also we have this legal view and this regulatory view and someone who is speaking from industry. and we have started to have a common understanding. And that's for me something that is one of the major advantage in Europe right now. And we must we must start to do that, not to all this fragmentation to put the pieces together and try to understand that there's two types of talents here, the tech plus the other views and join join 
do that, no? Work on the on the cross in this cross common vocabulary and this common understanding and view. And this is something that we have now in this beginning of this year. Thank you, Monsa. Again, extending on Mark's sentiment of. Um, you know, the lack of uh, standardization and this e extended fragmentation. Uh, Lucas, I'd love to hear your uh, views with regard to this topic. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's a couple of distinctions that we need to make. And the first one really is between crypto assets and uh, versus broader applications of blockchain. Because if we're talking about crypto assets, we're talking about regulations on financial services and financial products. Um, and that's a very specific domain, one specific sector, it has its rules, and there's a question then of what the optimal regulatory regime is, and, and has been pointed out by a few others, some, some fragmentation. Whereas if we look at sort of more broadly the question of, of adoption of blockchain and both the, the supply and the demand side, um, I'd say that probably uh, what we would observe about the blockchain, blockchain ecosystem isn't terribly distinct from what we see more broadly uh, in any discussion about how to have an effective tech startup and tech adoption in, in pretty any pretty much any domain. So so from Guard Times experience, for instance, we you know we're not in the crypto asset space. We do now have a, a technology platform for central bank digital currencies, but we don't offer any crypto assets and we're not regulated in that space. I don't really have any wisdom there, but what I can talk about a little bit is the, the sort of the rest of the world, which is to say um, the adoption of blockchain in everything from supply chain security um, to digital signatures to um, data integrity. And there Two points. One is that you know we we like being in Estonia because it's in general a, a good startup ecosystem. Um, there is a good talent pool. The talent pool that we need is not necessarily blockchain developers in the narrow sense. It's more it's more broadly good tech developers. It's uh, people with a background in cryptography. So you're trying to do sort of new research and new product development there. Um, you know, and and you're not working on one of the existing protocols. It's almost you don't necessarily want to get an Ethereum developer and then unteach them what they've learned about Ethereum. You actually want to get someone who has a good background in cryptography and computer science um, and then work with that. Um, but what we really prize and, and which we, you know, where Estonia has played a role in our history, but, but where we look globally is the demand side. Um, because really what, what we need is we need commercial customers um, and that, those can be governments, but as commercial customers, not as just as piloters who want to use our technologies, our products, our services, um, because they actually provide a functional advantage. But oftentimes there is a risk element there for them because it's something new. It doesn't fit within, um, within their understanding of, of how a legacy technology should function. Um, they have to be willing to, as an organization, overcome the initial um, sort of challenges of trying something new, uh, the friction around that. And, uh, and so what we found is that in a sense, if, if I had to do a global analysis of where we find good demand, it probably tracks pretty well to in general, who's on top of digitization. So um, we have our, our largest and, and best paying customers are actually in the US um, and we have a small team there, but we do most of the work from, from Europe for them. Um, and beyond that, it's, uh, it's sort of the usual large multinationals you would expect. Um, and, and here are our sort of our, our foot in Switzerland also, it's not just, it's not about the, for in our case, the crypto regulation in Switzerland, but actually it's the large multinationals in Switzerland who sometimes are, sort of, even if they're old and, and you think of them as slow moving, are willing to, to do a lot of interesting experimentation. Um, and it may be that the, the, there is an ecosystem effect there where the existing ecosystem in Switzerland emboldens these companies to then try new things. Certainly we've, we've seen that in Estonia too, where it's easier for us to work uh, with banks, with telcos, with companies that, that, um, that might otherwise be risk averse because we are established in the ecosystem here. Um, so I want to maybe point therefore to one, finally sort of this one last point to a particular role that government can play, um, which isn't just regulation, but it's actually adoption. Um, because I mean, our, our history started with the Estonian government basically saying we have a data integrity problem and, and PKI technology isn't good enough. And since then, we've worked in dozens of cases on solving challenges in a different and an innovative way, where the, the real value that the Estonian government brings is that they've been willing to accept what was initially a non-standard solution and to take some of those risks. Um, but really to do it not driven necessarily by a 
desire to innovate or to try blockchain, but really driven by the operational results or the, the value of the product or the service we're providing. So I'd say moving to talking about the results that blockchain can provide or blockchain-based technologies can provide, um, as opposed to sort of talking about blockchain itself um, is, is where we at least are, are looking right now and, and sort of what affects the ecosystems that we look at. Thank you, Lucas. <clears throat> I like that you point out, you know, distinctions between the different dimensions, and uh, and you look more broadly at supply and demand, and and and, and generally the end goal of uh, adoption. Um, Adrian, what are your thoughts uh, with regard to this topic? Well, if you look at um, the, what's what's happening, I think um, we we have a uh, the chessboard, the innovation chessboard has been filled with the pieces, all the pieces we need to play the innovation game or the innovation play. I think we have to thank Peter is and Eva and Nena for that, for instance. I think DG Connect is really did a good job to involve every party that we need to make this technology work. And I think that um, also the fact that European Commission and governments are trying to innovate their services themselves also helps in stimulating the ecosystem to innovate and to engage in uh, in uh, but i think that what we have to do now and i see that happening in in Adba, i think also the 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 blockchain service providers are have matured i think you can say that you can see that they are more aware of what the limitations and the risks and what the needs of other parties are so i think that we can really say there is some sort of a game with certain rules and certain liabilities and certain mandates that we can play in Europe, I think, that will happen and that we can make productive for ourselves. And uh, one of the things that I'm also very happy about is that there is some more attention for the data that we need to crunch with, um, with blockchain, because that might be the next frontier that we have really good data and really good attestations that, can, that we can put into our blockchains. If we don't have that, we'll still have a lot of problems, I'm afraid. So I'm happy with the way we are going. Again, could maybe quicker, but I don't think we could have gone much quicker than this. But if you look at three years back, it was still everybody was doing its own thing and everybody was, was happy maybe, but it was not very productive. And I think that we are growly, growing into a more productive stage at this moment. Thank you, Adrian. Indeed, it does feel like all the chess pieces are in place, uh, you know, to bring back your analogy, but it still feels like maybe it's still very early in the chess game. Uh, well, yes, and maybe you sometimes need a referee because we don't have a rule yet. And if you don't have a rule and it's free for all, then you have a referee and we don't have the referee yet, but maybe we'll, if we set the rules, then we can really start doing the game. We have to go from play to game. And I think we are well on our way in, in doing that. Agreed. And a referee with, you know, a standardized set of uh, regulations as an end goal would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, David, what are your thoughts on the characteristics of the blockchain business environment? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd initially like to react to um, something that Lucas said, because I'm, I'm very aligned with his thoughts in terms of it, it's, it's very obvious that a lot of, of the regulatory um, effort has been quite reactive in terms of what's been going on in the crypto asset. Um, space, um, you know, so, so to a certain extent, people were caught unawares and so have had to react to what has been happening there. Um, and I think that there's been a real education process through that. And I think there's a real opportunity now for those regulators and those those policymakers to be a bit more proactive in the other areas of blockchain. Um, so looking at how actually blockchain could become a tool of regulation rather than um, regulate and responding to to a technology, if that makes sense. So, um, so so I, that's the more more proactive than that that we can um, in Europe we can see regulators and policymakers being t um, to to what will be coming. Um, I think is really important. Um, there's also um, to echo some of, some of what Mark said. You know, the fragmentation is a concern, and 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 really a lot of the promise of blockchain is trying to eliminate fragmentation. Um, one of the concerns that I would have is that um, filling in those gaps, I think, is um, 
is challenging. It's much more long term. Um, and with that comes the inherent challenge of, you know, when will the value be realized? Um, and and that's, that will come with funding um, issues, those, those kind of things. So, so how, how we bridge the gaps between the fragmentation, I think, is, is, is a difficult but important um, thing to look at. Um, I'm personally really encouraged to seeing the governments um, wanting to innovate and collaborate on, on much more hybrid um, public and private services. I think um, I think that's a great thing to see. I think that's exciting areas for the potential of blockchain where we can see the, the, the public private um, working together. Um, and then there's another thing I think is worth observing is that um, you know we're right at the bottom of the trough of disillusionment in terms of you know in businesses. Um, and and that's a reality that we face, particularly us working in the industry. Um, and so we need to take those people who have you know gone through the hype, gone through the excitement, and are now are, are feeling quite disillusioned. Um, we need to take them on the journey as well. Um, we need to answer the questions they've got. We need to provide the technology that they think they need. Um, these are all the kind of where I think we're at, um, it, it, particularly in Europe at the moment. So yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, with regard to what you brought up, you know, reactive versus proactive is not is that not something that's quite unrealistic at this point of view with with the technology, you know, that's so cutting edge and is changing so rapidly from a day to day basis. So I think this is where this is, uh, and, and I would say this being in a in a small startup, I think this is where it's really important for the policymakers and the regulators to engage with with um, the people doing the innovation. Um, so, so, so it's a it's a two way conversation and it's continual feedback and and learning and you know um, because and that way they can be proactive because the policymakers and the regulators become aware of what's happening and from a technology perspective um, and um, the, those technologies can do it in a much more informed way rather than, rather than suddenly trying to introduce something which is contrary to what the regulators are trying to do so you know forums like this become incredibly imp important. Um, to, to allow that kind of, that level of engagement um, between between those those interested parties um, to, to, to sort of try and plot that way forward from a regulator and policy perspective. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, thank you all. You, you all raise uh, you know really uh, interesting points. Which brings us to our next topic, where I'd like us to explore you know the main drivers for a healthy and flourishing business environment for blockchain companies or startups. And let's look specifically here at policies, initiatives, and networks. Um, Mark, I'm sure you have a lot to contribute here. So let's start with you. Thanks, Alexi. I'd like to come back to a point uh, that you were just discussing with David and start with that one around engagement. Uh, I, I can't subscribe to that strongly enough. I can't articulate with, with enough passion how important it is to have that engagement. Uh, and for me, the number one is engagement between stakeholders so that they can share information, share opinions, uh, share insights into their strategies, uh, and frankly, just create a base level of understanding between all of the different constituents in an early stage ecosystem that can facilitate a productive engagement. Uh, and uh, let me just explain a little bit about what I mean. So oftentimes, particularly in this particular market, DLT and blockchain, it's overlooked that the innovators, the, the entrepreneurs, bring a huge amount of investment themselves. Um, and I just want to remind everybody that typically when an entrepreneur is choosing whether to launch a business idea, what they do is they bring this investment of their own intellectual capital, oftentimes their own seed capital, but most certainly a layer of innovation, ideas, their skills, the skills of others, and opportunity cost. And so bringing all of this value to the table, I think it's really important when we're talking about creating a vibrant ecosystem to make sure that you get the, the subsequent engagement from the government or, or the public bodies that are able to help foster that innovation through maybe supportive regulations and legislations, as you said, but also policies or frameworks that can be less rigid, that can be, be less cumbersome perhaps, and a little swifter than maybe regulations or legislations can be. I think also that sandboxes play an understated and undervalued role uh, to create safe testing, learning, and iterative capabilities that many innovators really, really treasure. And those types of frameworks 
can lead then subsequently to an environment that governments can help or public officers can help facilitate through a focus on allowing capital investments for subsequent stage development. So not early stage seed, but maybe the growth stage or those heavy lifting investments that are required where you get up into the tens of sometimes the hundreds of millions of euros. Uh, and also to allow governments to understand through this interaction, through this engagement, how they might create other mechanisms such as favorable tax regimes that could assist early stage companies and create environments to attract that talent and attract that growth. Uh, and just a few, a few other points as well, Alexei, because as you said, we at Inatba, given that this is our business, we, we do have a little bit of thinking on this topic. Uh, and, and by the way, just a shout out, if anybody really likes what we're saying, by all means, navigate to inatba.org, look at our papers or, or come and join us. And my apologies for the, the, the unashamed shilling of what we do. We are not for profit. Um, so the next topic is around education and knowledge sharing through the creation of both formal and informal groups, such as the one that we're having here today. And I know that the European Commission, in particular DG Connect with the Observatory and the European Blockchain Partnership, has done a huge amount to enable this both formal and informal exchange of information. And the, the parallel I would like to draw here is the example of the West Coast. So, you know, the West Coast has created a large number of very successful technology companies, the West Coast of the USA particularly around software. And, and typically the way that happens is through the informal ability of great talent and great capital to come together and bubble underneath an idea and raise that idea up or raise that project up. And if the project stands the test of the investigations by these intelligent and individuals, then it tends to fly. And a lot of this is done in very informal environments or alternately, if the project once people get to know it and investigate it and, uh, and understand those behind of it, doesn't hold water, doesn't support all of this wonderful innovation and talent that comes around of it, then the project drops that back down as the talent seeks its next opportunity. And those types of models that is very, has been very successfully used in particular on the west coast of the USA is something which I see a lot of parallel in the work that the commission is trying to create through the both formal and informal networks that's been set up. Uh, just three final points, legal certainty. You, clearly, as entrepreneurs, I've been an entrepreneur myself, um, unless you have legal certainty or easy to use frameworks that clearly indicate that there is a support structure for early stage projects, innovation, either through you know, surety of product development or the ability to service your clients with legal certainty, then frankly, it's very hard to warrant putting time, effort and funds into a project. And on this point, I just want to shout it out once again on behalf of our smaller members at INACPA that yet access to really basic services such as banking facilities and capital is still not easy for blockchain companies in this day and age, six to seven to eight years after we first raised this topic, we're still trying to help early stage companies get access to regular bank accounts. They can do things like pay for the water in their offices. Um, so that needs to change. And the final, two project, uh, the final two points I would like to make is around standards. So uh, I'll draw a parallel here with the internet. For those of us that were around in the early stages of the internet, and I was, I founded a fax modem distribution business off my credit card fresh out of university, it wasn't until the development of standards reduced friction and allowed silos to break down that we saw some of the really early internet applications create scale. And largely what that took was a commitment towards the development of standards, the housing of those standards in a non-commercial open source framework such as W3C, and the focus and the agreement of the international community to work on a standard that we now know as TCP IP as the bearer for data. And that was a critical point in the development of a, a parallel technology that I, I, I use as a parallel to DLT and blockchain that allowed applications to be built on top of this framework, this foundation, this technology platform. And there is a lot that I think we as the DLT and blockchain industry can learn from the need to develop standards more rapidly, Ad said it earlier. 
and I know that the, the European Commission in particular, DG Connect, is doing a huge amount of work to create education, awareness, and to nudge along this process of developing standards. Because without that, I think, and this is my final thought, Alexi, I would think that standards are even more critical than perhaps access to funding. Because without standards and surety that customers are not making a purchasing decision that will lead them down into a supplier dead end or vendor lock-in is something that is preventing mass adoption at an enormous scale. So uh, Alexi, with those thoughts, I, I pass the floor back to you and thank you. No, thank you, Mark. A lot of valuable information there. I'm not even going to attempt to summarize it, but basically a support structure across all levels and, and agreed with everything that you had to say. Um, we, we, have to be, we have to be quite conscious of the time because we still have a lot to cover. So uh, Monse, let me pass it on to you. Yeah, and let me come back and also be straight to the point, no? That's very inter interesting today. I will say today we are talking about Europe, no? And this is a fantastic day where we have a report and we have been what happens, no? And I agree with my colleagues in the in the panel that it's true we have fragmented and it's true there is a lot still a lot to be done, but I will focus on two things, no? First of all, Europe. We have a natural fragmentation that is very good. We have different countries with different cultures, and that difference that is a differentiation that helps us because this technology, the decentralized technology of the blockchain, help us to be ourselves and to work together. So uh, I think initiatives like the like the IB, IBSI or all the initiative around digital identity, this is clear that we can work together in Netherlands, in Spain, in Italy, in Greece, in Slovenia, and also develop in different stages and finally join the learnings. So that's it's our I think something that in Europe is unique. We don't see that in other in other places, and it's where we need to work together. How to do this cross national understanding, and whatever we have done, for example, in in Spain, we have been developing Alastria. Alastria is something very strange because we have been coming from from the industry, from a small, medium, and large companies, and we have worked for research and development with the academia. And moreover, we have called no, uh, and work with the administration and with the government, and we try to enlarge doing innovation. Doing innovation means to test, to learn, and that's something important. We cannot standard something that we have not learned. So, and that is the critical thing. If you have been investing on research and learning and just doing lessons learned and, ref and referring, you can build a an standard. And this is what, how we have been approaching digital identity standardization in Spain. We have the first standardization on that, the first rule from a national country. But that has been because we have been trying and learning about it. And this is what I know. This is where is the balance. If I have to learn, I need investment to test. And if I have this investment to test, I can standardize. So, you see, if you want to entrepreneur to be alone in doing this uh, this uh, this launch of idea, that is not going to work with a decentralized technology. You have to launch other, not to be together with other entrepreneurs. And this is about creating community and creating consortia. And from that place, just share cost, no? reduce cost by sharing uh, the issue of testing and has a good test lab to come on to the capital to tell to the capital, look, this is an idea that I have done an MVP that seems that there is a technical rehearsal level that is starting to be mature. And because of that, I can do a standard. And because of that, I can ask for more money to escalate. So this early stage phase is very important that we do it jointly. And that's the that I will say, you no, know, we are in the in this situation right now in Europe. Thank you, Monsa. Uh, really, really, really interesting points with regard to, you know, both the innovation and standardization. Uh, Lucas, uh, what do you have to say about this topic? So I think um, a couple of quick reflections in a sense on what uh, Mark and Munz have touched on already. Uh, Mark made some very cogent points about the entrepreneurial environment, which are really not unique to blockchain in the sense that 
what is good blockchain policy is also going to be good AI startup policy. And it's going to be good, I don't know, agri-food startup policy and so on and so forth. And so I think there's also value in recognizing that fact and having this sort of, this sector, if you will, or this little wedge of the broader sort of tech community and entrepreneurial community, look, what's good for, what's good for blockchain is mostly what's good for startups in general and for tech in Europe in general. Um, I think um, Monse did also point to some of the ways in which, however, blockchain may also require um, some unique um, elements. And in particular, uh, something I touched on already, which is um, finding ways to overcome that barrier of adoption and to, to create the sort of courage to uh, move toward a new technological platform. And I, I, I think what Alastria is doing is a good way to do that in the sense that you have found a way of scaling some of the um, sort of bit by bit and granular sort of individual relationships that we've had to build uh, with government, with industry to do that. Um, and I, I do want to react maybe uh, not negatively, but critically um, on the question of standardization and, and how to approach that. The standards are good. However, there's a, there can be a messy interface between standards and legislation. The standards work well when they exist, when they're out there, but when you have to some extent um, freedom as to whether you actually adopt a specific standard or not, and that's a business decision, right? And you, th th there may be business consequences to doing something non-standardized. It may be that you lose customers, but there can also be advantages to doing something non-standardized, right? So the, the classical case here is Apple who has often taken the non-standard approach to everything from the architecture of their operating system to the connectors on their iPhones. Um, and uh, in every one of those cases, they, they have encountered lots of criticism, but they've also been able to do new and innovative things. Um, and coming from a blockchain company that does things a bit differently to a lot of the blockchain platforms out there, um, that's, a, that's a decision of ours and there are consequences and there are spaces that we may not always be able to play in, but they're then also things that we can deliver that others can't. And I think what we would hope is that as the legislation becomes more mature, the result of that is not to say, this type of blockchain is good and is blockchain and we're happy with it and that isn't. There may be a standard, something that the W3C or some other international organization uh, curates, but the, the question as to whether a standard gets applied in a certain circumstance is, is distinct from that, from that standard. Um, and we've had some positive experiences with existing legislation being able to be sort of objectively stretched to cover blockchain-based technology. So for instance, the EIDIS regulation on trust services doesn't say PKI anywhere. It doesn't say exactly what the technology is. It's got some assumptions written into it that are a little bit biased for PKI and maybe those should be rewritten. But the successful way of rewriting that is not necessarily in the primary legislation to define this is blockchain and this is good blockchain. It's to look over the criteria to see if the criteria serve the, the legislator's underlying goal. And then at a different level to have the technological standards where you can have a wide variety of different approaches, blockchain-based and not blockchain-based, that meet that sort of underlying legislative goal. So standardization is good, but it's gotta be done in a way that doesn't get us to a situation five years from now where we standardize ourselves into what will be legacy in the future. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, it's that uh, digitization that's leading to this uh, increased entrepreneurial innovation. And, and often we see that that non-standardization becomes the new standardization eventually. Alexi, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. This is Lefteris. Uh, we are overrunning a bit. Can I please ask uh, you, and also I think it's uh, David's and uh, uh, Adrian's turn to speak, if we can wrap it up uh, in the next five minutes, please. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Lefteris. Um, Adrian, your comments on this topic? Yes, well, uh, very short, and maybe I would like to see, uh, I think you're only as good as your own ecosystem. And that's something we have experienced in the Netherlands in uh, around Eindhoven, where we have ASML, high tech firm. They need their suppliers, they need their banks, they need everybody to perform the way they do. And I think that goes um, for everybody in the blockchain area as well. You have to have a very well ecosystem in order to make your own performance uh, uh, top. And I think that maybe, uh, although uh, I think uh, Monse and, and, and uh, Petris are very good ecosystem conveners and facilitators and Mark as well. But I think we could do, we could have some more very professional, skilled ecosystem facilitators. They can, they can create the pre-competitive space. They can mediate in conflicts. They can, 
support spin-outs, they can support funding. That might be a role that we still need in the business ecosystem. Another one, I would like to see some more um, incentives for SMEs to start engaging in blockchain applications. That's still a problem for them, I think. And um, well, that's maybe a completely different topic, but there's another something to explore as well. That's it for Thank me. You. Thank you, Adrian. Yeah, so much, so much valuable information, not enough time. Uh, David, uh, real quick, your views yep. on this. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to bring up uh, another audience, which we mustn't forget in all this. And, and that is the um, consumers, the, the, the people. Um, it's very easy to talk about how we need to get businesses working and government working, but ultimately both those are serving, serving the people. Um, and the challenge around cryptography based technology is that it's not very accessible. Um, so I, I think for, for the end users, for the people who are really going to benefit from a lot of this stuff um, to, to, to be brought along for the journey, we need to see that investment um, into to improve that accessibility and, and the user experience. Um, I think we'll need to see custody type solutions for all kinds of things, not just your crypto assets. Um, so I just wanted to flag that we must we mustn't forget um, the end user um, and and that we really need to um, bring them along for the journey a, as well. Um, it's an important part of what we do. Thank Thanks. you, David. Um, so yeah, being being conscious of the time, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we will have uh, you know the community Q and A, and we had a lot more to cover within this uh, panel. But I'd like to thank you all again. Uh, that was really insightful and provided valuable perceptions of the current European business environment. So uh, yeah, that brings us to the end of the discussion. Thank you all again for being here and thank you for your contributions. Thank you very much. Looking forward to keep on, on this talk so for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much, Alexi, and a very big thank you to all the panelists. Uh, moving on to our second panel discussion now, the focus now shifts from the business environment to education. This panel will be moderated by Marina Niforos, an affiliate professor in ACC Paris. Uh, professor Niforos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I have the privilege of uh, moderating this next uh, session. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm an affiliate professor on the future of work with the French Business School HSC. I'm also a member of the observatory since its inception, and I have been in the blockchain space since uh, 2015, working primarily with the International Finance Corporation uh, of the World Bank Group in emerging markets. So the topic we're going to be tackling together for the next 40 minutes um, is uh, education, yes, partially, but larger than that, um, what should be um, the skills and innovation strategy that we should be putting together in order to accompany what is uh, our ambition? And, and I think we both heard that ambition in the beginning at the opening of this webinar today, it was articulated by Bateris, but also by Ms. Kylie. Um, we need to carve out uh, a niche in the competitive landscape and become a global player in this race between the US and China. And to do that, we need to be able to put together uh, the proper skills uh, strategy and have access to a talent pipeline that will enable us to reach our sort of business and, and, uh, uh, and use case goals in order to bring to the, the ecosystem to the maturity that it requires. Um, so in order to be able to shed more light on what is the status quo right now in Europe, what are we seeing as emerging demands for skills? Um, do we actually um, think that Europe is in a good competitive position vis-a-vis -vis other global players in terms of having the right pipeline? Um, is there, we heard a lot about the supply and demand in terms of having the right skill force, um, workforce. Uh, do we see a deficit between what will be demanded and what our pipelines allow us to have as supply for that talent? And if we are considering putting a sort of an, uh, a coherent uh, uh, skills strategy um, around blockchain, uh, what do we need to look at? Um, uh, there are elements of core technical skills. Um, there are elements of educating 
a client, we heard about the adoption barriers. Um, we have questions of reskilling in a lot of businesses who will have to deal with um, transition from legacy systems, and that means not only technological, but also organizational, um, and also pure research initiatives that will help us also consolidate uh, a technological advantage in the infrastructure. So we have asked um, our four panelists to consider those questions. Uh, we have here with us today uh, representatives from, I'm glad to say, from the report of Mr. Yaglis, um, two of the uh, best in class, according to the maturity of the ecosystem represented in uh, uh, Malta and Cyprus, and two of the second best in class, but also two of the largest economies, France and Germany. So from France, we have Sara Tucci Pier Giovanni. She's head of the laboratory at CEA List. Um, Joshua Toole, Dr. T uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Joshua Elul. I hope I didn't mispronounce the name, sorry about that. So Joshua is director for the Center of Distributed Ledger Technologies at the University of Malta. Um, we have Florian Glatz, who is president of the Bundesblock, the German Blockchain Association, and also uh, co-founder of the European uh, Crypto Initiative. Um, and last but not least, we have a change in our program because um, Mr. Polemitis had, unfortunately, was detained because of uh, a sickness issue. He will be replaced by uh, Professor Yaglis. So um, uh, thank you, <laughs> Professor Yaglis, for stepping in as well. And we, we will give our, our audience the extra opportunity to ask the questions they didn't get to ask before. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Sara. Sara, can you please share with us your own perspective? I understand you've been also working on a report at a national level in France. What do you see as being the major issues regarding education and research initiatives in France, but also in Europe in general? The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, actually, I'm very happy to be here today because um, sometimes actually we think about blockchain as something that is already there, we just need to use it and to build the right application, right? And in fact, during uh, the, the work that actually we, we have done on the report, and the report was actually a report on technological challenges, uh, research challenges on blockchains, actually we identified that the, pro the problem, the reason why many, uh, how to say, um, uh, prototypes done in industry and whatever that wanted to use blockchain for very ambitious applications uh, were a failure. And this, that the, the reason was because actually there are some technical challenges actually to be coped with. And to do that, we need more research and more, how to say, high skilled engineers that actually have an education in distributed systems, cryptography, mathematical stuff, and all these, uh, these things. And in particular, um, when we identify these challenges, we needed to prior make a priority on them because of course we, all, uh, we, we know about them. We know about, you know, uh, energy consumption of blockchains. We know about the fact that smart contracts today are not uh, today um, adapted to express uh, complex applications, for instance. So we have a lot of different problems, right? But we wanted really to identify those that actually need to be immediately in concept, unlocked to unlock the most ambitious applications. And the first thing to do is to have energy efficient blockchain infrastructures. And this is, was the first point. And we see, hopefully, that there are many alternatives uh, that are emerging now, uh, such as those on proof of stake, whatever, graph-based, other kind of uh, opportunities and so on. But still, there is a quest for more expressive, evolved smart contracts, scalable execution of these smart contracts on these platforms, and privacy and fairness of the users, how this user can access these platforms. This is also something that we need to think about. And this is actually the fact also that is completely new in the, at least in the technical 
uh, I would say domain is that, that the technical protocols now are coupled with incentives. And this economical you know, some, some aspect is absolutely new and actually calls for actually um, research teams that they need to work together and they are multidisciplinary coming from distributed system, cryptography, game theory, economics and so on. And this is actually absolutely a, a novelty, I would say, in the in the in the in the research in, a, in the research research panorama, I would say. So this is mainly the, the point on research. The other point is that these are the, the needs actually that, uh, that are there. But now how this research team can work together. So there is no, at least in France, no particular program on blockchain. So we have programs on, you know, strategy, on uh, com quantum computing, on artificial intelligence and these things, but there is nothing on blockchain in particular. So this means that now researchers are working mainly with the foundations directly. And foundations, it means uh, Cardano, Ethereum, Tezos, Algorand, Interchain. This is really nice from a certain point of view because you can work on very cutting, uh, cutting edge technology and uh, projects that are very technological. You are not working on application at, at all. So this is nice for a researcher, but in, an, in another sense, you work in very small and um, problems that are directly related to the platform in particular. So this means that, for instance, you know, um, issues like interoperability between platforms, you will not tackle this, thing, this kind of stuff because this is something that maybe will be uh, interesting for Europe, for instance, or for an, a national level, but this is not actually interesting for uh, those that are developing the platform itself that just, just has to win you know, the race. So this is something that we need to think about. So the funding of activities of research that are not related directly with a foundation. Uh, it is also important because now many researchers are actually leaving research teams to go uh, indirectly working in the foundations. This means that we are just leaving, uh, losing brains in some sense. They are going directly there. Thank you, Sarah. May I ask a follow-up question? If they're leaving, you're talking about a brain drain of talent. Are they leaving the European Union or are they staying within? It depends. It depends on the platform, right? See, if, if I talk with about Algorand, it will be US, of course. But if you go, it, many of these platforms are uh, Switzerland today, right? Um, I don't know if this is, I think this is Europe, but this is not... <laughs> European Union in the, sense, in the sense that we are talking today. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm picking up on the point you, you made before about the need for multidisciplinarity um, in, in the blockchain space. And I will pass now the floor to Joshua because um, they have developed actually a master's program with a very multidisciplinary um, uh, view in mind. And Joshua, would you like to tell us what was sort of the strategic thinking behind it and where you see the evolution in the space in Malta, but also how can that be scalable to a, what needs to be done at the European level? Yeah, so the requirement or actually the realization that we needed a program like this really came about when we were working on the Malta's legislation. We had um, computer scientists, legal professionals, business professionals around the table. And uh, we realized that we really have different vocabulary, different lingo, and different perspectives of the technology. So we ventured to develop a multidisciplinary master's. And the idea behind it is that we take in students and we give them a broad introduction to blockchain, but we also introduce them to the fields that they are not professional in. So our lawyers learn how to program smart contracts, our techies learn about law, and then they dig deeper into their areas of specialization. Now, I wouldn't trust our law students to develop my smart contracts, but at least they can go around the table and discuss between them and have appreciation for the various problems. And I think this um, multidisciplinary nature is something that we need to see, not just for our educational programs where we're trying to um, allow for professionals to go down this route, but we need to start seeing this 
at all tables of all stakeholders involved, our regulators, our policymakers, they need to be versed in technology, law, and business and finance and economics. And I think once we have that multidisciplinary view and we have these different experts working together, we can actually be more agile in getting in place the regulatory frameworks and ecosystem. In fact, this is something that would work to Malta's advantage. We're a very small place and uh, we were a handful of people working together to get this legislation and regulation through. And um, now we're seeing that uh, the Mika and the DORA laws, which are great, and um, it's going to take quite an amount of time. Why? Because there's a lot of going back and forth to various uh, different stakeholders. Um, it would be great if everyone could just meet around the table and over a number of sessions come up with a solution. You know, we don't need to be perfect from day one, but uh, we need to uh, provide to the various stakeholders legal certainty. And uh, we don't want to stay, we don't want to be too late in the day once we provide that legal certainty. Um, so I would say besides the multidisciplinary nature, um, often people say the skill sets that you require in blockchain are the same skill sets that you require in other finance and other IT based industries. And that is true for many of them. Um, however, I think what we got wrong in these previous industries is that we didn't have this disciplinary nature. So let's make sure that we don't set off on the same path as previous technology based industries. Let's make sure that we're setting on the right path where our different experts no longer see the other professional as those guys in the other department, but they see that they're a single team working together. And I think that that brings me to the next point that really we need to be working on a harmonized view for Europe, whether it's across education, whether it's across um, an ecosystem regulation. Um, I think we're at the beginning, we're getting there, but now we need to see live applications where it goes beyond just the conferences, the educational programs and regulation. Now we need to see people getting their hands dirty in the wild. And um, I think we can achieve that once we have blockchain being used by people and they don't even know that they're using it. That's when a technology becomes a success. So we need to start deploying more applications in wilds as well. And there needs to be some level of education there, but uh, not at, at the level of education that we need to develop, that we need to discuss in regards to policy. Um, so we need education across the board. The demand is there. Um, the, where's the supply going to come from? And um, that's one big question. Thank you, Joshua. I think you actually made the link to a point that was made in the previous panel. I think it was David who, who made it, who said we, sh we should not forget the consumer and ultimately the citizen. And how do we onboard them? That could be a form of education or awareness building. You can call it many different ways. But obviously, it doesn't necessarily go through the more formal channels of educational institutions, but perhaps a different initiative that would need the support, obviously, of policymakers as well um, uh, in the form of an academy of training for blockchain or, or more than one, let's say, set of skill set, but that would uh, bring the understanding of what technology does, doesn't do, and how it can be used, uh, because there is a lot of... of um, um, I don't want to say suspicion, but perhaps some reservation regarding some past scandals and 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 so so the complexity of the technology. Um, so I will pass now uh, the floor to uh, Professor Yaglis. So you have been um, uh, in this space. You were one of the early movers uh, with the University of Nicosia. You offered the the first uh, certified program in cryptocurrencies in this space. And um, uh, Professor Yagli is also as sort of the, the report architect, uh, you can provide perhaps a perspective of what's happening, not only from the Cypriot example, but also largely in Europe right now, in terms of this being sort of a, a critical success factor for us to get to a maturity level. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marina. Uh, so, yeah, as, as you said, I've been in the space for, for a number of years. So personally, I've been involved uh, with crypto since 2011, and I've been with uh, uh, the University of Nicosia and the program uh, since 2013. So what, what I'd like to, to do in the next couple of minutes, because I don't want to monopolize the discussion, I, I had my opportunity earlier, is just to share a couple of experiences and lessons I, I think I've learned from being in the crypto education space for the past eight years or so. So lesson number one is that there is 
there still is, and not only there is, I think it's, it's also growing, there is still an imbalance between supply and demand for talent in this space. So the industry uh, is looking for talent and by talent, I, I would like to uh, reiterate the points that were made earlier by both Sarah and Joshua. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking about both research, technical talent, but also multidisciplinary people that could be project managers for blockchain projects or legal professionals or finance uh, experts, or you name it. This is an inherently interdisciplinary uh, area. Then there's still a huge gap between the demand for such skills and the supply uh, of skills that are, are coming out of universities or other educational institutions. So, as I said in my presentation earlier, the space is growing. I mean, the educational space is growing. We've had dozens of programs in Europe, but we, I still think we need more. Uh, we ran a MOOC, uh, a free uh, open online course on digital currencies twice a year. Uh, it's being taught by Antonis, who couldn't be here today, myself and Andreas Adonopoulos, who I think most of you will know. We still get <clears throat> close to four to 5,000 students every time in this MOOC. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm really happy that we have thousands of students in every iteration. But on the other hand, this means that these students do not have any, anywhere else to go. I would welcome competition in this space. I would welcome other programs coming in. So that's, that's, that's number one, the imbalance between supply and demand. Second thing, <clears throat> I still see a widespread confusion around the blockchain, crypto assets, digital assets, tokenization, and you name it, uh, uh, terms in the space. So the, the, the confusion that, you know, Bitcoin is not blockchain and blockchain is not Bitcoin still runs very deep. And not only to the general public, which might be, you know, more understandable, but even to people that are in positions to make uh, decisions and develop policies, and they should have, uh, you know, a, a much deeper understanding of, of what's happening. Thankfully, we see less and less of this, but, but, but it's still there. So I think we have a responsibility as, as educators to expand our educational efforts beyond our traditional programs and try to clear up some of the main confusions that still exist in the space and you know the mass media and the journalists that want to have you know uh, sentimental stories to, to sell do not always help in, in clearing for the uh, for, for, for the non-technical people at least so that's number two and finally number three I've said it in my presentation earlier but I cannot stress it enough this is a really fast moving space I mean it's fast moving. <laughs> When I started in 2011, 2012, 2013, conceivably, especially for people like me that started working professionally in this and, you know, were spending most of their days around uh, crypto, you could keep abreast all the developments in the space. Nowadays, it's absolutely impossible, even for large teams. I mean, we have a team of 35 full-time people at the University of Nicosia, and I'm still sure that we cannot follow everything that's happening. I mean, even in the space of the last, I don't know, month or couple of months, we've seen layer two solutions uh, taking the spotlight and DeFi, obviously, and now non-fungible tokens and crypto art and digital collectibles and stuff like that. This is very, very, very fast. So in, in conclusion, there are, I think, a number of lessons for us as educators. Number one, and I think it was mentioned both by Joshua and by Sarah earlier, we need to cooperate. We need to find channels that we work together more to develop uh, joint programs, either for education or for uh, research or you name it. Second, I think we need to move beyond traditional academic education. So having a master's program is fine and we do that, but I think the future here is working in continuous professional education, continuous professional development, 
and professional certification. And I think uh, we have Mark here from, from Inatba. I think Inatba can play a great role there because certification and you know globally or at least uh, Europe-wide uh, uh, accepted professional certificate or a set of certificates is not something that the universities alone could do. We need industry acceptance and we need to have many industries on board. We need to have the regulation regulators on board. We need to have the financial services industry. I mean, the banks are, are developing uh, digital asset programs and they are doing custody and they are doing loans and they're doing stuff like that. They need people in their compliance departments to be certified professionals knowing about digital assets. Who's gonna provide this certification? This certification I think needs to be a standard that will be jointly developed by the universities and the industry. And since we are all here today, I would like to leave this as a, as a proposal for us to discuss uh, further. I think the industry, the regulators and the universities in Europe should work hand in hand to develop uh, standards for professional certification in this space. I think this would be good, not, not only for, 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 for industry itself, but I think for Europe and the world at large, this is something that is still missing from the blockchain space. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yaglis. And um, I think you make a very good point about uh, disaggregating some of the sort of overarching goals of the skill strategy. In a preparatory discussion we had yesterday with, with a group amongst ourselves, um, and Mr. Polemitis made this distinction that, you know, uh, there's, there's the core skill set that will be required, the technical core skill set, which is quite sophisticated in its profiling, right? It's, it's a computer data scientist. But then on the other side, we have a more general public, other stakeholders, industry players, SMEs, um, users that will require a different type of training that, as you mentioned, cannot go or will not have the time for it to go through traditional educational channels. And therefore, a different platform has to be envisaged um, I don't know if uh, you know the program and if you want to comment on it, um, Digital Europe announced in December, I think, that they will be participating on the SHES program, which is funded under the Erasmus Plus, uh, working with the University of Lyon in order to try to do a five module or a five session module, uh, but a vocational training program on uh, software and business um, blockchain uh, skills. Um, and I, I presume that that's the type of program you're thinking at, at a larger scale that could be under an INATPA umbrella or a similar umbrella that would bring both industry and academic partners together. Yes, this, this is something like, you know, what I have in mind. And I, I cannot stress enough that this needs to be ongoing. It needs to be continuous. Uh, you know, we, we have our courses at the University of Nicosia and it, I'm always surprised, I shouldn't be because I know it, but I'm still surprised every time that I'm teaching a course, I need to redo like 70% of the material because the space has moved so fast. So we cannot move at the space of, you know, at, 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 the, at the pace of a European project that might take from the time you write the proposal to the time that it's approved and you've got the material ready, it might be three, four years down the line. Three, four years ago, Many of the terms that I'm discussing today, like, I don't know, DeFi or, or NFTs or uh, layer two solutions wouldn't even have been invented as terms, not, not as technologies. We need to have a continuous uh, cooperation. And that's why I'm saying it needs to be industry led or at least in, with industry participation. Uh, we need to move, and obviously the European Commission can play a hugely helpful role here by creating the framework through which we can update, refresh, and be and be at the state of the art in, in, in educating people in that space. Thank you. And I think you gave me the perfect segue to move on to Florian, because Florian is the non-academic representative on this panel, but uh, he represents an industry body, a Bundesblock, and uh, he is that rare holy grail. He's both a software developer and a lawyer. So uh, Florian, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, pleasure to speak and um, listen to you guys. 
Um, I also want to make three points, and I think they've all been made actually in one form or another, which uh, actually um, makes me happy. So there's actually consensus. Um, for me, the most important point, obviously, as an industry body is education on the lawmaker and regulator side. Um, that may not be the first thought when you think of education. I obviously agree that we need education very broadly, but in particular, when it comes to policy making, I think this is our biggest strategic weakness at the moment in Europe. Uh, we are not, we don't have the tools, nor I think the knowledge capacity or structure at the moment in the relevant bodies to make the policies we need. And um, I think m almost everybody struggles with this, um, but um, I don't see us really improving strategically yet or even recognizing this strategic issue. And this is what I really want to uh, push. And um, beyond just obviously educating the policymakers and lawmakers, um, which is a multi-year process. And I think actually Europe is doing, um, the EU itself is doing quite well there. On the national level, it's really different. I can say even from Germany, where we have a big blockchain community, the national level regulation is often just very uninformed about the subject matter details. But um, I think we also need to be more courageous about how we draft policies and generally how we assess their impact. We literally, like, I always think of, you know, think of Facebook. They have 3 billion inhabitants in their virtual country. And when Facebook makes a policy change, they use, you know, what they call A-B testing in many ways to find out where their policy has the impact they desire. And I feel as lawmakers, we're just steering blindly, mostly based on notions that are totally unconnected from the goals we want to reach. And as long as we don't recognize that there is a gap and that there is a problem, we will continue to make bad policies and fail to grasp the opportunities that Europe has in a digital future. Um, and just I don't want to go too much into it, but just as a last point on this, I think in particular with blockchain, and this is why it's so relevant in this space, there is a new kind of regulation awaiting us, and it's coming up very soon. It relates to all these DeFi, decentralized finance, and other types of decentralized use cases where traditional regulation simply does not work because we're con we're talking about structures that partially are outside of the league of the traditional legal system or the grasp of the regulator. So we will need technology driven regulation. It will involve some form of technology, be it around digital identities, be it around other things. And um, th this will fundamentally change how we regulate. And we need to start to build the structures, the knowledge and everything to get there uh, as soon as possible, actually. Um, my second point is public sector innovation. So how can the public sector absorb innovation from the private sector? And I can say from Germany, and it's probably true for um, many other countries, it's still too hard for startups to be part of public procurement processes um, of um, yeah, public administration and, and public bodies that are looking for technology providers for innovative use cases. So this needs to be made simpler. Uh, and lastly, I think um, the education of the general public in Europe is, um, it can be improved. Um, I don't feel that we currently create from the EU top down and, and from the nation states top down that we create a positive sentiment even around uh, cryptography, crypto assets, blockchain. There's not generally a positive sentiment to be recognized, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, when cryptocurrencies go up in, in market value, consumers get warned Europe wide to not put their money there. Um, um, there is, um, you know, AML, uh, no money laundering type things being said about crypto that don't factually are true when it comes to the actual risk for money laundering in crypto, which is often much lower. So we should actually start first to embrace this innovation that we generally consider decentralization, blockchain, and the innovations that come with it as a positive force. And then, of course, um, we should, as, far, as fast as possible, onboard the general public onto such infrastructures. And I think POCs would be some really smart idea here. One, I think, is, um, uh, you know, in, during Corona, there were opportunities, of course, with certain fiscal measures using blockchain technology or uh, things like that. But 
I think also now with the Corona vaccine, um, uh, 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 Europe wants to create a, a, a certificate for vaccination. So there are opportunities to use some digital blockchain based identity infrastructure to basically onboard millions of people at once and educate them in this way about the potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. Um, I would like to pass the floor to Joshua for uh, he wanted to, to pick up a thread about the, you know, the regulatory uh, innovation to just to put it under a bracket of what you said. But before you do that, I'd like to stay a little bit on the last comment um, about um, dispelling some of the negative, uh, you know, aura that has um, kind of uh, uh, surrounded blockchain in the eyes of the general public and how we can sort of explain uh, the good as well as the bad, because the bad seems to be getting a lot more news. So how do you think that should be instrumentalized? Because media also, you know, you see everything, it's either overhyped or over demonized. Um, so is who, where do you see this being channeled? Is this sort of a European body that you see actually doing some kind of an awareness campaign? This is an education that should happen at the national level, how, who do you see as being sort of the body accountable? And if it doesn't exist, what it would look like? Is it more associations such as yours, the national associations that kind of work more grassroots? Um, you know, is it being more vocal on the media about the positive stories? How do you see that actually playing out, practically speaking? Thank you for that question. So uh, two answers. Um, I think we, the industry body, we're we're surrounded by enthusiasts. We're preaching to the choir. Like literally everybody we reach is an enthusiast mostly. So we're in a sense, not the right people. Um, what, let's look at the US for a moment. What the um, a banking uh, oversight, uh, um, whatever bureau has done in, the, uh, in January, they've just said all the banks in, in the US are now allowed to settle their transactions in in cryptocurrencies, private stable coins, you know, whatever, we recognize that this is an infrastructure out there that actually works to transact money globally very cheaply and efficiently. And, you know, we now officially deem this a thing that can be done. I, I think this is the most, this is the best sentiment you could send. And right now we're doing the exact opposite in Europe. So we're, we're sending a negative sentiment in the market about this. And of course, the second best thing we could do is that obviously Europe invests millions with this AI and blockchain fund into this infrastructure. So Europe has a um, deeply vested interest in people wanting to adopt this technology because then the companies they are funding will be successful. So indeed, the, the EU should have a public awareness campaign. They should, they should invest in getting people invested to make their other investments uh, more successful. And it's both on the policy level, what we do there, which right now I would say is not creating a positive sentiment, but also on the public education, which um, uh, would be very helpful. Thank you. So I will let uh, Joshua uh, intervene. Joshua, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the point for education for regulators, I, I think that is really key. Um, and on that point, uh, what Malta ended up doing is creating a new regulator, a technology regulator. And I say that in inverted commas, because we don't say what you can and what you can't do with uh, technology. But th this new type of regulator is there to support the other regulators, to give them the technology insight, to provide assurances on the technology. And why is this important? Because expertise in this area is very limited. And we're using blockchain in finance. We're gonna start using blockchain in health and in all sorts of different areas. And then we're gonna start using AI. And all these different authorities need to educate themselves. They need to get the expertise in these different areas. So why not centralize that technology related knowledge and that, uh, uh, that uh, certification of technology to a single entity? And this has been a topic of discussion that Europe has been looking into a while, but I think it's finally time for them to sit down and get this right. And yeah, there's a lot of interesting questions in the field of uh, laws and blockchain and DAOs and new type of structures. We're asking these types of questions in Malta. Can we create a new type of legal entity adequate to host a DAO that, that isn't physically here, that is in cyberspace? So I think these are the types of questions that people in Europe need to start thinking about. We shouldn't wait for the technology to regulate it. We should start thinking about where is the technology going, allowing for it to innovate and creating an environment for it to innovate in that space. So I'm in complete agreement with what uh, Florian said there. 
Thank you for those comments, Joshua. Um, I, I think uh, you're touching on an area that was mentioned also in a previous panel. What happens if we're going beyond financial services where you have one regulator? Well, what about if you're in the energy sector or in mobility, there are other types of regulators. So having some kind of a support structure <laughs> or a knowledge uh, uh, you know, support system for regulators in terms of how you translate uh, you know, the, the existing legal frameworks and regulatory mandates with evolving, constantly evolving technology, uh, given also the pace is, is, is so uh, rapid, I think would, would make a lot of sense. I think this is what you have done in Malta by creating the technical, can you tell us a couple of things? Cause that's something outside your academic. Yes, so um, I'm also chair of the Malta Digital Innovation Authority. And what it does currently for the crypto space, when someone goes for a financial license with the financial authority, the financial authority mandates that these operators must get a technology assurance audit through the technology auditor, the digital innovation authority. So it's only mandated where other authorities require it. Otherwise, it's voluntary. Um, so this is the fine balance that we found. Create a voluntary framework. If you want to come in, come in. But if it's mandated because it's deemed to be high risk or critical by other authorities, then so be it. Um, so I, I think this is an approach that we really need to look into because expertise is so limited, it's going to be impossible for all the different authorities to try to get their hands on different experts in the area. But that, that more or less sums it up. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience and I'm very mindful of the time we have, uh, I've been told we have about seven, six minutes left. Um, it's not directed to a specific uh, person on the panel, so I will just throw it out there, whoever wants to comment. Are you also looking into the Gaia X initiative with regards to federated data sovereignty and data interoperability? Would anyone like to address the question or if you are aware, if you're personally working on any initiative that's related or? I've heard the name, but uh, haven't really looked into it. Um, I would venture to say that there are discussions between the people uh, that are running both uh, that are involved in something like the European Blockchain Partnership or other kinds of bodies. Um, uh, like, for example, in Germany, I know that uh, Andreas Hartl, who is both in, involved in the Gaia-X from the German side, but also in the European Blockchain Partnership and so on. So there are a lot of connections person-wise, I think. Um, uh, between these two projects. So I would very much hope that this uh, Gaia X protocol really that will create this European cloud infrastructure will use some parts of the identity layer that is being developed on the blockchain side. I would assume that people are aware of this, but I don't know the, 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 the state of things on the Gaia X end. Thank you for that. Um... I don't have any other clarifications from the person who posed that question. So um, I uh, move then to for us to have some final words from all of you. Um, and I would like to give each of you uh, just a minute to react um, because at the end of the day, this is about providing some recommendations of what you'd like to see with your different hats, whether it's as educators or as stakeholders in industry, et cetera. So if you were to be two years down the road um, and we're having this webinar today, if we were to have something in two years from now, what would you see as a measure of success of some of the things that we discussed today? What you would like to see two years from now in terms of strategic objectives that will have been realized in that space, in that time frame for us to move closer to building the different types of elements we discussed as part of the skill strategy and the talent pipeline. I'll give each of you the floor. Let's start with Sara, who hasn't spoken. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, I would like to change the name. I don't want to hear about the name blockchain anymore. <laughs> you know, the point is, uh, it's really, really tough to to think about blockchain as a, as a vision. Blockchain is just a data structure. And this is also the problem that we have when we talk about the technology with people that is not skilled about it or with citizenship. It is quite difficult to, to actually give a positive sentiment if, if the term 
is so obscure. So I think that we need to focus more on the values we want to bring. And the values are trust, transparency, decentralization, right? And I don't know, I don't know any other alternative name, but I think that we need to actually find some catalyst, which could be a vision of decentralization. I, I don't know exactly Gaia X exactly because I'm, I'm not working inside, but I, I know that they are they need to federate different cloud services. And you you will actually uh, came up with sort of decentralized architecture. We had a many different uh, European projects, very interesting ones. Uh, for instance, the Decode project that was more related to citizenship services, voting, participation, participation to actually monitor air pollution or something like that. So I think that these are the things that really can lead this kind of research, this kind of thinking, this kind of business. I'm, I need to say that crypto is not something that they really can sell to industry partners. Sorry for that, but whatever is crypto, crypto asset token is something that they are scared. That kind of, you know, run, run away from me and say, oh no, I don't want to hear about it. Okay, so we need to, 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 to do that, to use this kind of incentives and, and everything just as a mean that contribute to a vision. Not for, it is not a goal by itself to, to sell tokens. So rebrand and focus on the end results rather than on the means of getting there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Joshua. Yep, so I'd like, is I'd like to see that uh, the program that George recommended is live. And that's one um, uh, measure of success. And I'd also like to see that in two years time, well, um, like Sarah said, we're no longer talking really about blockchain, but we're talking about decentralization. We're starting to question what powers should we decentralize and what powers are we happy with being centralized? I think that's where we have the decentralized world and the public challenging the centralized powers that we're really gonna find this balance in between where uh, is the ideal um, perhaps way forward. Thank you. Florian. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, what I would like to see in two years is a vibrant ecosystem of decentralized blockchain use cases uh, in Europe using open and permissionless blockchains actually, um, which are also using or where the users using these use cases on these blockchains be it in the energy sector, financial sector, mobility sector, supply chain, many things possible where they are identifying themselves in this decentralized ecosystem with a digital identity that was issued by a European member state. If we have that in two years, we've done really well. My goodness, that's a very specific target. I hope somebody's taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last but not least, George. First of all, Marina, excellent question the best question you could ask for the closing of a panel. So, so yeah, for me, I think I said it earlier, what I would be really proud of, 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 of the ecosystem is if two years down the line, there existed an, an association or an institute, uh, a pan-European or even better global one, uh, endorsed by industry, endorsed by academia, endorsed by regulators, endorsed by policy makers, that would be the de facto standard for the certification of professionals working in the digital assets or blockchain space. And I'm, I'm really happy to see the, 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 uh, the discussion in the chat and that, that, that this idea is getting traction. So I'm, I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna follow up with everyone after we finish today. And, and I would like to really thank you very much for this panel and this webinar it has been a, a, a really uh, I think useful and productive experience. 
Thank you. Can I report on the chat that, that George just mentioned? There's been a flurry of ideas and uh, people have already picked up the gauntlet on having an open platform. So I think we're going to see it happening in much sooner than two years down the road. So thank you to everyone. We're right on the dot, having spent one more minute than the allotted one. So I want to thank warmly everybody who's contributed to this panel. It's been a privilege to moderate it and um, bon continuation. Thank, Thanks, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Lee Forrest. Uh, moving right along, now it's time for our third and final panel discussion, focusing on pan-European national and regional initiatives, as well as key policy developments. The panel will be moderated by Jeff Bandman, founder and principal of Bandman Advisors, and also a Philip Professor of the, University, of the Institute for the Future in the University of Nicosia. Mr. Bandman, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And yeah, what a what a fascinating uh, afternoon. It's uh, obviously only a you know very important responsibility for uh, us as the final panel to uh, wrap up all the many strands of interesting uh, information, uh, including the presentation by one of our panelists, uh, Ina Dukuzov, and to uh, both wrap up the thoughts and give us some uh, inspirational thoughts and actionable thoughts for the way ahead. Fortunately, uh, we have a really wonderful uh, international star-studded panel of um, policymakers, technologists, innovators, entrepreneurs, so uh, it's great. And so what I'll do is ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves uh, in, individually in the order uh, shown here on the slide, and uh, then we'll jump right into the <coughs> topic. And I would ask you know, participants uh, you know, who are not on the panel um, you know, but attendees, you know, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to get as, to as many of them as, as possible. So Nina, I know uh, people, uh, you know, probably uh, may have seen you since you presented earlier, but if I could ask uh, you first to uh, reintroduce yourself and then we'll go to uh, uh, Dr. Dunster and continue on. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have Nina? Maybe she's on mute. Okay, well, we'll come back to Nina. Uh, uh, Thomas, Dr. Dunser uh, from, uh, from Liechtenstein. And thank you, Jeff. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is uh, Thomas Dinser. I'm uh, director of the, of the Office for Financial Market Innovation of the Principality of Liechtenstein. Um, yeah, originally I'm an engineer. I've been working uh, for some years in the financial sector, also as an entrepreneur. And it's, I'm working now for the government of Liechtenstein since about seven years, eight years. Um, yeah, I was also the, uh, the, the head of the uh, Blockchain um, Act project of Liechtenstein. So um, I've been uh, pushing this, this topic also in Liechtenstein and um, was re responsible for developing this uh, innovation framework um, we have installed in Liechtenstein for, uh, for fostering fintech. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, uh, Thomas. And uh, Nina, do you have audio or uh, we'll keep going otherwise? And I'm still not hearing audio from Nina. Not sure what the issue is. Um, uh, Joe Bronkers. Yes, uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Joe Bronkers from the Netherlands. I am representing Fibri, the Foundation for International Blockchain and Real Estate Expertise. We are a global organization, nonprofit, that is examining how blockchain is applied in the real estate industry. We are represented by 120 people across the world, and they all lead their own uh, networks where they bring people with real estate background, IT background, uh, legal background, governmental background, or research uh, expertise together. Uh, one of the, 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 the main issues that we do in a year is our global industry report, where we, the last time, uh, highlighted 300 different products that we find in the space of blockchain real estate in the world. So I think for the European Blockchain Observatory, it could be very interesting to see how we can collaborate on this. And why I'm also here is because I'm representing INADBA in different working groups. We are working in uh, climate action and real estate working group in INADBA. And there's a sub-working group on unique object identifier. I, would I think especially that topic might be very interesting in this panel discussion, but I will talk about, it late, about that later. And uh, I'm happy to be here. OK, 
Okay, fantastic. Uh, okay, Nina, uh, do we have sound now? Uh, maybe a little louder or no, now you're muted again. Hmm. All right, uh, Robert Kaluza. Uh, hi, everybody. Nina, maybe you should try to reconnect. Usually go out and go in helps. Um, I am Robert Kaluza. I'm one of the co-founders of Belon. Belon is a blockchain platform. We have our own proprietary uh, blockchain platform developed by Polish, uh, Polish and European mathematicians and cryptographs that fulfills and joins three aspects of, uh, uh, of paradigmas. For, first of all, we are uh, digitalizing uh, fiat currency only in fully regulated manner. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. We are putting the whole documents on chain to fulfill uh, regulatory, uh, again, regulatory aspects of it, of both durable medium and right to be forgotten GDPR rights. And this is all merged by, uh, by sovereign identity. Uh, Apart from being a co-founder of Billon, I'm also a leading the Imani initiatives in my company. So we obtain a two Imani licenses and based on those licenses and our DLT, our blockchain, we managed to launch a service that trades national currencies around. So uh, we have quite a lot of experience on how to try to make a blockchain to the market although still a lot of challenges in front of us to come. As of myself, I'm always somewhere in between business and IT, trying to, uh, trying to join both, both of the words. So I think on that level, I just, if you have any questions later on regarding the technology or my perspective, I'd be more than happy to share it. It's, it's great to have so many uh, people with uh, technology backgrounds and innovators you know, helping to form this discussion of uh, of policy uh, initiatives, and you know, Robert also from you know not only working on sovereign identity, but also you know being uh, you know regulated uh, entities uh, as as e-monies in the EU. Definitely a lot of valuable perspectives here. I'm sure, we look forward to hearing about those. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, can you hear me now, Jeffrey? Oh, fantastic, Nina! Loud and clear. Uh, <laughs> I I had to um, leave and then load on, and uh, I'm sorry. I'm really very sorry for this delay, but I don't know what was wrong. Uh, actually, thank you for waiting for me. <laughs> um, I'm uh, actually um, from Slovenia, from Ministry of um, Economic Development and Technology. Uh, working as a head of a project group for, for new economy and blockchain technology as well. Um, and then um, I'm also a co-chair and member of European Blockchain Partnership, as you may uh, uh, heard uh, this uh, um, in, at the beginning of uh, this webinar. Um, after that, I'm um, a member of um, blockchain uh, expert policy group uh, at the um, at the uh, OECD, uh, and I'm also a vice chair of um, UNC Fact uh, Advanced Technologies um, gr a group for yeah advanced technologies uh, and and um, many more. But uh, those are the most important issues that um, uh, that helped me to build uh, a kind of um, ecosystem also here in Slovenia. And uh, it, it was uh, gradually uh, developed. And um, uh, I'm quite uh, um, honored uh, to, to be a part of this uh, also as a member of uh, the ministry, as a member of the state, uh, and that could contribute uh, very much to the development of uh, blockchain. So, so much for the beginning. And uh, I will participate in this debate uh, with the pleasure. Wonderful, wonderful, great, great to have you, and you know, hear hear your voice now. Uh, and uh, last uh, last uh, panelist, uh, Edelson uh, Osorio, uh, please introduce yourself. The floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? It's okay. Okay. Yes. So I am Edelson. I am a computer scientist and expert on cybersecurity, and I'm founder of Original My. Regional Mai is a platform for e-governance and cybersecurity. We have tools since the digital identity 
to notarization of documents, and we are helping on processes of digitization for companies and even governments. And well, I am member of ISO. I'm helping to build the standards on uh, privacy, security, and identity. And I'm doing the same in Brazil with the standardization entity over there. And th that's basically the thing I'm doing, helping the governments, helping to build some policies over there and bringing that knowledge to Europe and helping uh, to build the things over here. Okay, well, it's great to, great to have everybody and you know, a lot, a lot to cover today. So why don't, why don't we uh, start off our discussion and, and uh, we'll ask uh, you, Thomas, to uh, maybe uh, start us off on this topic. So um, you know, let's take a, take a look at, are there any major policy gaps at either the EU or the member state level that should be addressed in order to fuller, further develop the EU uh, blockchain ecosystem. Um, thank you, Jeff. Yes, maybe before before I start with the, the answer to your question, I, I might uh, start uh, with a with a kind of overview about the ecosystem of Liechtenstein because Liechtenstein it was not uh, part of this report that uh, was present before, and uh, maybe it's kind of, kind of interesting for you to hear that what we have done in the last years. So. Um, it, we have we have uh, tried to to establish kind of an ecosystem for for fintech and and blockchain in the last seven years. Um, one one result of that was the, the blockchain act or token act we have um, uh, set in force um, beginning of last year. So we have now one one year of experience of um, of an active blockchain act in Liechtenstein, meaning the experience how uh, for a registration and so on um, and. So we see that the, the ecosystem is now um, just adopting to this uh, this kind of new framework, um, and this is kind of, um, kind of interesting to see. Um, meaning also we have kind of um, many discussions with um, entrepreneurs and companies in practice to to understand what their problems are and how could, and can we deal uh, with the state in that in that manner. Um, so in the last year we have been just um, focusing on on. That, uh, community building um, aspects and also about know-how sharing and uh, this may be something that uh, we have heard in the discussion before it might be interesting uh, education is important we have um, uh, also kind of university uh, program in Liechtenstein um, but uh, we try to, to have a low level um, education form like uh, in, in courses or just that somebody has, has no idea about um, some aspects of the legal um, ecosystem or legal framework uh, can have access to that within, within short time and not have to, to go through a, a long period um, study or a, a master's program. So, um, and also research is going on in Liechtenstein about that. And I'm, I'm re really happy to see that the, the, uh, the focus is very um, on a good level and discussion is going on on, a, on the interaction of technology and, um, and legal aspects of, um, of blockchain applications. One interesting thing we have also put in place is that uh, the, the op um, opportunity to, to have digital shares and digital bonds. So on blockchain basis, um, and we have now the experience how this, this framework is working and this is also working very well uh, to our um, experience. Can I ask just on, on that topic, um, yeah. you mentioned the, the Blockchain Token Act and sort of digital shares and, and digital bonds, I mean, you know, there, there are a number of jur jurisdictions um, and, you know, from, um, you know, kind of the US, US being one of them where, uh, for example, you know, really the development of, you know, kind of security tokens or tokenized securities, you know, there's been a lot of kind of attention and effort, but the in terms of just the, the level of activity, you know, may, may not have been at, you know, at the level, uh, you know, thus far. Are, are you finding that with the either kind of the new kind of legal certainty are you finding that these sort of kind of tokenized securities are where where people are, um, you know, really taking advantage of the new uh, legal framework, or is it with what thing with people would call uh, utility tokens? Where where, where are you uh, finding the the impact from this thus far? Yes, the, the interesting thing is that um, uh, we have introduced two things. The first step was to to introduce kind of a civil law fundament for for tokens, uh, just in, in general. So. Uh, it's clear that you can own and pos uh, possess token and transfer token and every uh, the fundamental questions we have clarified them and 
And second, we have introduced um, this concept of uncertificated rights so that you can issue uh, purely digital um, share tokens, for example, or bond tokens. So tokenized securities. And uh, we have experienced that this, this uh, legal certainty we have introduced there uh, is, is very uh, well accepted from the market. So there are companies that just use that, that process as, as a standard uh, to, to issue uh, the first shares or the first um, kind of bonds just uh, by using this uh, kind of technology. And this process works very uh, seamlessly. So it's, it's, uh, for us, it's kind of a success to see how this, how this works. So legal certainty is very important for, um, also for investors to, to use this technology. That's great. Thanks for, uh, for clarifying. Um, and any other thoughts in terms of uh, kind of policy gaps at the yeah. EU or, or member state uh, level um, that you yes. wanted? To um, so another thing we have introduced is this uh, innovation framework I've, I've mentioned. And we had, have done this because we have seen that um, the innovation of, of, the, of companies is much faster than the innovation of the legal framework. And as we have heard before, um, this, is, this is a big issue also. For, I think Mark has mentioned it before. Uh, from Inatpa, uh, and this is something um, we have, um, yeah, we have introduced the concept of the regulatory lab in Liechtenstein. We have um, also the my office of for financial innovation is is uh, here for to support companies, and that's that's uh, the process. But um, what we see now is is kind of a, a challenge also on, on European level. That means. Um, if somebody wants to do um, something with blockchain in in financial market sector, uh, it's, it's and this is not possible in the legal fr framework. It really takes time uh, to to adopt the legal framework. And so, what we, what we see with Mika and and also the pilot regime, this is, is great work done by the EU Commission. But it, it takes time, and it, it's it's good that it takes time because then it's uh, kind of a sound uh, discussion that we see there. But we need definitely some kind of, of sandbox re regime uh, um, on the within this this financial market on on the EU level, so that um, a national authority uh, can can just decide if a, a new technology is, is on the same level uh, from from uh, in abstract manner in, on a functional side. So, uh, like the traditional uh, regulation, it can allow. Uh, we must allow such um, applications also if, it, if the legal framework is not ready for that. So this is something that to me is, is very important to see um, um, yeah, also on the you know, European level. The second point is that we, we see that um, this classification is a problem. Um, so if, if you uh, have a new kind of instrument or you have a new kind of um, um, application like DeFi or DEX, um, uh, the point is the, the time to have an answer uh, if this is um, just how this, this instrument, for example, is classified or um, how uh, this is treated by financial market laws. Uh, this uh, takes longer than, than some years ago. And this is also um, uh, just stopping um, innovation in that manner. So this is also a challenge we have to, to address um, on the national level, of course, but also on a, on a um, uh, EU-wide level, I think. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. So I think Joe, you wanted to uh, respond uh, or add some thoughts on this uh, on this topic of uh, the policy gaps. Yeah. Well, I think a policy gap that we managed to bridge in the Netherlands, but uh, in, in the Netherlands, Fibre, we started with a group from uh, industry re representatives from the real estate sector. We saw that the industry chain is very fragmented and stretched over a long period in time, and a lot of information gets long gets lost. So uh, we started as a Fibre working group to, to see how we can better standardize and uh, uh, aggregate data so that we can create digital uh, real estate passports. But once we started with this, we got in touch with the Dutch Ministry of Interior who are responsible for the building uh, addresses and uh, 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 the registrations of buildings. And they were actually doing the same at the same time. And then we, we uh, uh, agreed with to, to collaborate and to start a, a public-private collaboration on developing a, a system, a concept for unique object identification. And what we found out is what is really difficult, all the information that is uh, stored at the different uh, stakeholders is stored in silos, right? like uh, has been uh, said a lot of time today. But how can we connect information from silos in a better way? Because what we think 
it is not the information that belongs to all those uh, parties, but it is information that belongs to the people that own buildings. How can we open up silos and get people, uh, can, how can we give people better access and uh, uh, control about their data? And if you then scale this up, the Netherlands is only a small country. We saw that there's a huge uh, a synergy with uh, main topics in the European uh, policy, uh, like, uh, for example, the Green Deal or the, the the competitive European digital infrastructure. But if you look, for example, to the Green Deal, where we have the real estate industry, which is really a major sector that needs to contribute to become CO2 neutral continent in 2050. Uh, if you take into account how much raw materials are used, half of the materials in the world, how much greenhouse gases are emitted, how much traffic is driving from and uh, uh, from uh, building sites uh, and job sites. Uh, there's so much processes involved where, where uh, improvements can be made only by having better data and better connected data that we think, uh, for example, the renovation wave of the Green Deal taxonomy, organizing a unique object identifier, a means, an infrastructure means that can help to identify and connect those different silos so that people can better organize their processes and contribute to these uh, European goals. That is what we want to do. And we're doing pilots with uh, building renovation passports or with uh, uh, material certificates to enable circular models. But what we need what is what we did in the Netherlands, a collaboration with the government and the market. And actually our, our question to, to all the people here is how can we set up similar uh, collaborations between market and governments in different European countries on this concept? Because I think digitalization doesn't end at the border of a country, but digitalization is starting in Europe with EPSI, for example, but we need to, to bring this really worldwide. And that's what, what Fabri likes to do. And I'm, I'm really inviting everybody who wants to collaborate and do a pilot on this with us. So thank you. Great. Thank, thanks for that, John. Very interesting. So having this kind of shared uh, data standard and uh, data, data protocol that, you know, kind of getting into this operational level, uh, you know, but can actually promote kind of greater transparency and collaboration across borders and to achieve, you know, important EU goals. Um, but, you know, kind of across kind of different silos, whether they're national silos, uh, operational silos. Uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very interesting. Um, next, next question, we'll, we'll start off with, uh, with Nina. Um, what would you say uh, in terms of which policy developments and in initiatives at the EU level have been followed by EU member states in order to support further development of their national blockchain ecosystems? Oops, uh, you're, you're muted. Thank you're you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we have here some issues, uh, maybe uh, to um, go back to your previous question uh, slightly. Um, uh, we have strong commitment to achieve um, high, uh, high standards, high uh, goals uh, here within blockchain. But uh, we have very unconnected or um, unlinked um, uh, steps uh, how to how to reach this we have institutions like uh, for for example oecd it um, um, it uh, motivates us to develop blockchain strategies on the national level okay this is one thing the, the other thing is that um, uh, european blockchain partnership is going to develop a blockchain strategy for the next um, um, period uh, or the next semester uh, and this, this is the, the, the second thing. We have some national, like uh, we uh, could see in the, uh, also in the uh, report, uh, we have um, some strong national um, backgrounds or strategies also uh, in, in the, uh, for blockchain or artificial intelligence, uh, data uh, infrastructures uh, and so on. But, um, it is maybe uh, not very synchronized and uh, this is maybe a, a huge the hugest gap that we have here in europe the second thing is that uh, we are um, setting some uh, frameworks how to integrate blockchain into uh, different policies and into different initiatives so um, for example what we did in slovenia we 
uh, established, uh, we adopted a blockchain uh, action plan very early in 2018, and it was like a, a kind of strategy, but it was very operational. Um, and uh, as a result of this, uh, we had uh, also, with the reference to the previous um, uh, to the previous uh, panel, uh, we had uh, uh, very strong support to blockchain startups, uh, not uh, only as um, uh, as uh, advocacy, but also uh, in financing uh, um, point of view. Uh, we developed uh, um, a call for projects. It was uh, dedicated to um, uh, advanced technologies that are uh, today uh, also covered by Digital Europe program. And uh, what we follow here is uh, to transfer um, that innovation that happens uh, in the startup and uh, um, small and medium enterprises world also to the traditional company. And this is a reference uh, also to the, to the previous framework. Um, the second thing is that uh, we are now facing with uh, um, that next generation EU program and also uh, recovery and resilience uh, fund. Uh, we have here a strong opportunity to cover, uh, um, and the, it is strongly uh, recommended by uh, European Commission uh, also to cover cross-border projects. Uh, cross-border projects, um, uh, one of the typical cross-border projects is uh, European Blockchain Services infrastructure. Um, um, and um, we can integrate uh, these cross-border projects also with uh, the concept of uh, attracting different communities and different governments here to cooperate uh, within European blockchain services infrastructure. Um, the second thing is that we have to raise the commitment to integrate uh, this technology also on the, uh, on the national level. And uh, yeah, I agree, we need to um, build a uh, stronger ecosystem uh, with, uh, and we will also um, uh, the, use that report uh, and uh, upgraded report that uh, um, blockchain and observatory and forum prepared as a tool for um, connecting, for strengthening that blockchain ecosystem and to define some common steps, how to deal with this, uh, to, um, to increase the use of blockchain also in the uh, traditional technologies. And this would be maybe um, uh, the issue how to bring all together uh, here and uh, a harmonize approach. The second thing are standards that uh, we uh, have to adopt, um, but um, uh, maybe for that uh, pr uh, <clears throat> part of education, uh, we are facing in blockchain with very specific issue. Uh, in other technologies, there, there was strong um, research base and then uh, the knowledge was transferred from the research base to uh, the economy, okay? Here is the process completely uh, opposite. <laughs> Here we have a strong um, um, entrepreneur um, part and the research part is quite weak, yeah. And we need uh, some supporting mechanisms to be developed, to be uh, tailor-made for blockchain companies and startups uh, to um, support those companies also in the um, next coming years. Yeah. And maybe to um, more uh, um, more effort to put in converging technologies. Um, before in the previous panel, uh, there was a question about Gaia X. We are trying to connect this somehow in Slovenia uh, blockchain and Gaia X uh, uh, data federated infrastructure. Um, uh, also within the um, supporting environment. And I hope we will um, be able to do this in a short period of time. Uh, so to cover also that strengthening the supporting environment for uh, development of blockchain. It would be from my side. Sure, anybody like to comment or uh, respond to, to Nina's observation? Uh, I yes. see Joe, Joe raised it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, I will keep it brief, but um, I think EPSI is a very good example. And um, I think EPSI is creating this uh, European infrastructure. And until now, EPSI was uh, focusing on the topics uh, you, you mentioned them before, uh, that are more uh, uh, allowing people to, to interact with the system. But something that we are developing, the unique object identifier, is helping us to, to connect also physical objects with the same EPSI infrastructure. So when we come from the Dutch perspective and we want to scale this to European and beyond perspective, 
I think what we are doing now is trying to make it as much as possible compatible with FC infrastructure. So again, for us, it is a huge opportunity if we could do some pilots in countries with, uh, with these use cases that we are doing, because I think we can contribute to make EPSI also on those physical objects really a success because we have the use cases ready and we are compatible with this. So it would only encourage me to, to, to follow up on this. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for that intervention. And, you know, it, it's, um, I think the, these points are really quite timely. I mean, Nina, you know, obviously alluded to the Recovery and Resilience Fund, and there are a number of, you know, kind of objectives there in terms of uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of the digital digital Europe uh, component and uh, kind of the, the green goals. And, you know, it sounds like, um, you know, speaking of converging technologies, it sounds like, you know, some of the t technological uh, standards and protocols initiatives that, that Joe uh, is, is alluding to, you know, really help to kind of promote, uh, you know, kind of convergence and, and multiple uh, objectives. Um, so I do want to uh, make sure we we've um, ha haven't uh, gotten to a couple of our other panelists. Oh, sorry, Jeff, uh, can I add in? Because I think Joe, you mentioned something very important, right? Why those organizations are around is the fact that we are suddenly starting to move not only to discuss over technology, but EPSI is a great example. is is trying to discuss about the use cases and how we implement it, right? So not only about regulatory technology aspect, but answering why we are all doing this. And that's, I think, starts to be the one of the most important aspects of all of those, I'm sorry, technological gigs that are here to, to, to resolve real problems, not only to develop technology. Great, no, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Robert. Um, and actually, I was gonna go to you, um, and, and you may have already started to address this just in terms of um, you know, your, your view in terms of whether there's any kind of good uh, practical examples of initiatives at the national or, or regional levels. And certainly it sounds like there were a number of initiatives you were working on kind of with, within Poland where your, your companies are based. Um, but you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. All right, I think I will continue my talk uh, thoughts from uh, based on what Nina and Joe has said is that, let us think is why a company, a commercial company would want to go and uh, in, initiate with those initiatives, right? Because obviously we want to build the ecosystem of uh, ecosystem of blockchain to uh, make it bigger, to make it, it more popular. However, the main issue, uh, issue that we should address is this usability of a blockchain is why we are doing it, what, uh, what problems we are going to resolve. After all, the end users, I think it was mentioned in the previous panel, is do not care that there is a blockchain, some uh, traditional, uh, traditional uh, centralized uh, database behind what they are using. It just needs to work. It needs to resolve, must be easy, and so on. So uh, for me, the most practical initiatives are the ones that are actually talking about the implementation of what we've got to, uh, to start the pilots, to start uh, to make sure that those uh, community of uh, commercial companies, smaller fintechs, uh, large uh, uh, big tech companies, and as well as uh, 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 governmental and university people are joined together and try to build something that is useful for a people. Uh, I think EPSI, it's a great example, uh, example where they were, I was so thrilled that actually there was something, to, uh, that there is something uh, last month, or it was one and a half a month, the standard for piloting the infrastructure, uh, blockchain infrastructure in Europe, right? Is that is very comprehensive. It actually asks and puts together a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of concept, a lot of thoughts behind it and sees what is pretty much already available on the market that we can benefit for the good for, of the people. So definitely EPSI and Blockchain for Europe in that, in that sense, it's a, quite a good organization to do. 
The second part of the uh, organization that actually would benefit of participating in this in industry type of organizations. Uh, uh, I can, uh, I think the la latest one that we've joined, and I think there is a lot of uh, discussion is this uh, morning US based the FinTech companies Mobi Forum when they discuss how this can help the uh, uh, how this can help the entire blockchain industry to help the business use cases again. Though they are talking about the the uh, identity, about the transaction, how to make sure that it all fits together. The innovation with a need with the regulatory, and it's all brings it brings it together. Um, my next thought about this is that. Usually for myself, the more effect effective are the more focused and smaller organization. Joe, I think your organization is a great example of something that I definitely like to uh, uh, talk to you at some point to see whether we cannot help each other already that we uh, develop something that can be a beneficial of, uh, for yourself uh, in the future. Because then again, those focus organization and focus uh, 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 industry initiatives are much more down to the earth much use use case focus where the benefits are closer to be uh, delivered that's that's you know certainly great to see this panel not only uh, benefiting uh, the people who are watching it live and in the future but actually to see kind of new collaborations uh, uh, you know potentially developing among the, the panelists so that's all uh, you know what, what we love to see um, so uh, there's some questions in the Q&A, um, so I want to try to, uh, from the audience, we're going to try to kind of cover, cover those. Uh, there's one about uh, privacy, uh, one about privacy, and since I, the word privacy is there, we naturally uh, will go to Ed Edelson first on this one. Um, so, um, you know, since the industry is, is, needs some uh, assistance in terms of guidelines, um, and here, really interesting question, and, and this actually is something that was alluded to by the French privacy authority, CNIL, a couple of years ago um, in some of their kind of writings on uh, reconciliation of GDPR and, you know, implications of blockchain for privacy there. So the question is about uh, the role of uh, hash functions. And, you know, could hash functions, uh, should they be considered as an anonymization technique? Uh, is that process uh, sufficient? Should that be considered a best practice? Uh, Edelson, would love to hear kind of your, your reactions. I think first on the hash functions, but then, uh, you know, other thoughts about uh, kind of blockchain and, and privacy, perhaps more, more generally. I think for the question, and uh, I think hash functions for privacy, they like the, the new policy or the regulation should consider that kind of thing because you can anonymize all the content through a hash function who can uh, like authenticate the integrity of the content being being presented. So like uh, there's a lot of concerns about, uh, and not concerns, but questions, people, th there are some people question, uh, like having questions about, oh, but can I uh, convert the hash to the original document? And we know it's impossible. It's one way conversion. So the document, through the document, the hash sheet the hash is calculated. So uh, I think even for notarization of information at all, uh, the hashing uh, algorithms, they are very important. And in, in our regulation and, and the policies, I think we don't need to talk about the, the algorithm or the kind of the, or technique being used for hashing, but just focusing on what the hash does, like providing uh, some kind of anonymization to the content being presented. So I, I really think uh, the regulation should consider hashing systems and talking, and we need to have some discussion about that for sure. That's, that's, great. Also, the, also the contradiction between privacy and transparency. And that's what we <laughs> all, uh, always try to deal with. But if you want yeah. to be transparent, people say you're not pri you're not uh, covering your privacy. And I think hashes are a very important means to help being transparent, but also secure the privacy. 
Exactly. And, and last year I was talking, I, I have a speech, uh, the contradiction between transparency versus privacy. And I talk exactly about that. How can blockchain provide and leverage the transparency at the same time providing privacy to our data? The data don't need to be stored on chain, but we need to authenticate that data to prove the integrity of the data being presented. And blockchain is perfect for that, for sure. Yeah, and uh, Edelson, if we can ask you to kind of for forward a link to that speech to the organizers, and then when they send around the links to to the, you know, to, yeah, to our, our panel, people will be able okay, to sure. uh, ac access that. Um, I'll be happy to. Another, another question, and it looks like uh, Robert has put his hand up to answer that, uh, is what uh, government accelerator pilot, uh, uh, what ex government accelerator or pilot? Uh, grants initiatives for blockchain startups in in uh, in Europe. Sorry, I needed to press on mute. Uh, so honestly, we never use maybe in a, uh, right now the latest one with the EPSI tender we applied for that. This is a definitely a blockchain initiative that uh, it's really dedicated to blockchain. Apart from that, we rather use a general R and D or uh, innovative types of grants. So I would really recommend, and definitely blockchain initiatives work within that. So in Poland, we are using uh, NCBIR grants. So that's a national center for research and development are purely R&D grants that, that uh, to develop a new functionality and found a new knowledge. Uh, I would really encourage you for looking into Horizon 2020, I think it's right now 2027, and uh, uh, as, uh, and this, uh, how it's called, uh, EBI Accelerator, uh, initiatives that, that, you can, uh, that you can apply for a decent kind of a funding for uh, development and launching a service on the innovation launch of the world. Obviously, you would need to compete then with uh, uh, with the startups or initiatives uh, outside of a blockchain. But because a blockchain is an in innovative area, you can definitely work for that. Uh, usually, if this is not a specific in a single technology, usually the grants availability and uh, grants um, size is much bigger than, than only the data to blockchain. So my good advice would be go to the, your country, uh, uh, your country uh, uh, research and development centers or initiatives and look for the grants for an R&D uh, technological development. In Europe, definitely the Horizon initiative is a great one to look and uh, try to, to look into that. That really can boost the speed of implementation of a companies. As of accelerators, I would recommend going for uh, accelerators that are much more sector specific. So Billon as such, we went for the uh, very successfully ended uh, two accelerators. One is with FIS. This is American based company, the largest uh, uh, largest producer for a banking software in the world. Fidelity Information Services. They have a, a they have a accelerator for uh, for the startups and RBI is the second one. Uh, Raiffeisen uh, Raiffeisen International. It's a great startup program. We just uh, graduated that program. We implemented MVP with them for a, a fund token uh, fund tokenization platform, and we are just discussing on how to implement it, it uh, onto the market. So those are really on hands that are actually helping you to grow. I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Well. So uh, yeah, I, th I think you did. But I think you know if this were an award show, uh, not only would be saying that you know all all of our uh, panelists receive awards, but also uh, the loud music is starting to play, and I see our our hosts uh, come coming on to say it's time to uh, to wrap okay. up uh, this 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 panel and and today. Although you know, frankly, we were we're just uh, scratching the surface. I know all, all the panelists uh, had had more to say, and and you know, we, questions were were coming in, but. You know, at this point, again, I'd like to you know thank uh, thank all the panelists for your for your insights and intervention. Uh, thank the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum for organizing the session, inviting me to to moderate it. It's certainly been uh, enlightening getting to know the uh, the panelists and and hearing today's discussion as well as our prep. 
And with that, uh, Left Terrace, if I uh, turn it back to you for the last word here. Thank you very much, Mr. Benman. Your idea about a wrap-up music is uh, actually good. I think we will uh, consider it for one of the next uh, workshops. We have now reached the end of, of our workshop. I'd like to thank all speakers and all panelists for the very interesting and insightful discussion, as well as all of you uh, for your attendance. The sessions video recording, as well as the presentations and the workshop report will be made available to everyone in the next few days uh, on our website, eublockchainforum.eu. Uh, in addition, all registered uh, participants will also receive an email uh, for this material. If you haven't already, please also consider following our account on Twitter. Uh, that is at EU Blockchain. Thank you once again. Have a very nice evening.